Speaking of counters, here we go on the dashboard. So let's talk about the tachometer. Up until 1964 on the MGB, it's not a tachometer, it's a rev counter, a revolution counter. It's a mechanical instrument. It's on the T-types and on the early spridgets driven off the back of the dynamo. It goes through a reduction box, perhaps. Uh, on the spridget, it doesn't, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. But that, that demands that you have the right size pulley on the front of the dynamo so that you get the, the right output on your, on your tachometer. It is cable driven. And when the cable starts to get old and snags on the, on the, the, uh, the cable that's, that's spinning, starts to drag on the outer sheath, then it winds up and lets go, winds up and lets go, and the needle flicks. Same as on the Speedo. In 1964, we go over to a tachometer, an electric device made by Texas Instruments that was powered on the positive side of the coil until about 1971, either with an external impulse loop, a little piece of a block of plastic and a strap of metal, or a little bit later, uh, an internal impulse loop. And then around 72, 73, they brought an extra wire up from the coil, from the distributor side of the coil, white with black, which has got a really powerful pulse to it and, and uh, ran the tack off, off that. And that remains the same through 1980. The tack hour is pretty easy. If it's, if it's flicking, you know, then it's the cable. Um, if it's inaccurate, it might be that uh, the, the unit itself is faulty. And it might be that the, um, that the size of the pulley on the, on the generator, if it's a T-type or a, a spridget, um, is, is the wrong size. Next one up we've got is the speedometer, which is a two-part unit. There are two mechanical units inside that gauge. One is the speedometer, which is, which is a, a springs and magnets. And then we've got the odometer, which is a PAWL, P-A-W-L, and a ratchet. So the Speedo uh, is, is calibrated, uh, is designed to meet your gearbox and your rear wheels. So if you change the rear wheels, the diameter of the rear wheels, say you don't run bias by tires anymore, say you run radials, like, I mean, 99% of the people on this call probably, um, then it's possible that you've got a different number of turns per mile than the speedometer um, was originally set up because of the bias ply tires. So to check the odometer, if you've got a question about whether the odometer works, run along the expressway. Here you got to trust the government, but they do a pretty good job with those mile markers. And the farther you drive, the more accurate your um, your test is. So if you set your trip odometer back to zero at a mile marker, or look at the trip odometer, and, and uh, you know you shouldn't be looking at all this stuff. You should have somebody riding with you. More fun to drive the car with somebody in the car anyway. Give them the number, and then at a distance down the road, when you cross another mile marker, ten miles, twenty miles hence, then see what that figure is, and it should be the same. If it's not then there's something wrong with the gears in, inside this, the, the speedometer, inside the odometer, and it's clicking off more or less miles than, um, than it's designed to. The speedometer, springs and magnets, uh, is just it's a certain amount of drag that's set up. And again, like the tachometer, if the cable, they're all cable driven, from the earliest to 1980, if the if the cable is binding and and it uh, winds up and lets loose, winds up and let loose, you can end up with the speedo flicking quite a lot. You everyone's experienced that, um, and very often changing the cable takes care of that. <clears throat> there are a bunch of bunch of problems that'll happen with the speedo. Um, sometimes it's it's just all just all over the place. And when we used to send them to Nicinger Instruments, who no longer does the work, uh, now you're going to send them to uh, West Valley Instruments, 
in California. John Wolf, W-O-L-F-F, does that work in Ohio. I know there are other people around that do. Um, they, they'll often say, well, you know, the back end of that thing was packed up with a lot of grease, which means dried out oil, because there's a certain amount of oil that escapes from the gearbox and wicks up the speedo cable. And if it gets pushed into the back of the speedo, uh, it, there's just, it's lubrication's a good thing, but not that much lubrication, it'll, it'll cause problems. I have seen on speedometers where the needle is just fine and then and then just temporarily, just just temporarily it falls and rises. Falls and rises. And if you look at the tripodometer, when the tripodometer is rolling over to the next number, it's depressed and then it comes back up again. Depressed, the number rolls, it comes back up again which means that, that something's binding in the odometer and it's slowing the speed down. Interesting stuff that happens, but um, there is a way to make sure that your speedometer is correct. First of all, there's a, a four digit number of down around five o'clock in the speedometer face. From 1968 through 1974, chrome bumper Bs, that number's 1280. That means that for every 1,200, uh, 1,280 times the speedo cable turns, it registers one mile on the odometer. In rubber bumper bees, um, that is commonized with everything else at the same time, to 1,000 turns per mile. So those are, those are clocked at 1,000. The midgets are 1,376. The earlier MGBs with the little larger gauges, uh, they, they changed. By, by 10, I don't know what, what it is, I can't remember, 1440 to 1450 or something, um, when they went from bias ply to radial tires, just to make sure it stayed correct. But the speedometer rebuilders have got all the gears and all the equipment to make your speedo run correctly. For instance, I run a 3.9 MGB differential in my MGA. So I, I did the test, <clears throat> I pushed my car through two one hundredths of a mile, 110 feet around there, um, an exact distance, and counted the number of turns that the speedo cable made. Therefore, I was able to tell uh, at the time it was Nisinger how many turns per mile my speedo made. They have a form. Um, Morris at, at West Valley Instruments has a form he'll send to you. He wants to wants you to push it through a certain distance and check the the turns of the speedo cable. I always do that three times and then average them, gets it more accurate. And from that, then they'll calculate um, what, the, what the gears are to run the odometer correctly. And then they can set up the speedo so that that works correctly too. Next thing, John, yes. Doesn't tire size, the different tire sizes have an effect on the speedometer? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Not much, but yes, absolutely. Okay. And if, I mean, for an instance, if you got an MGB and you think, oh, this would look cool with 15 inch tires, you can argue it does or doesn't look cool. Yeah, that, therefore you got fewer turns per mile. And, yep. and, and uh, so the speedo is going to read low. Yes. But yes. again, with, with everything in place, your car, your gearbox, your tires, you can make that measurement and, and send your speedo out and have it correctly calibrated. And I, I know on my TD, when they, the shop sent my speedometer in to get repaired or redone, um, whoever did it, they were Nisinger's workers. They weren't working at Nisinger's, but they were their workers because they knew my speedometer. They had the original information on the back that I did 25 years ago that Janet sat there and counted the ball. Okay. <laughs> that all going around, yeah. But yeah. They, they somewhere. In a, in a warning that if your speedometer is acting up, um, go, out and, go out and drive it. Just make sure the odometer is correct. Because if the odometer is wrong, uh, if the odometer is wrong, then you want it. You want to get that information to the rebuilder before you spend two hundred bucks have it rebuilt. And it's just in it's you know it's performing great as long as you're getting twelve hundred eighty turns per mile. But if you got some uh, some other um, combination of of tires or something in, in the car. Uh, you've got a four-speed gearbox and a, a, a four-synchro four gearbox and a 67B. Um, uh, you know, they'll fix your speedo 
according to the number that's on, on the face of it, but you want it correct. So getting the right number of turns per mile is important, but to check it, you want to go out and drive it on the expressway through, through mile markers to see. The fuel gauge. So up through the TF uh, sports cars, we, we have a fuel warning light. And that light comes on when there's two or three gallons left in the tank. It's just an on-off switch back in the tank. That, that Doesn't that spark? Why would that light the gasoline on fire? Well, I don't know, because the environment is, is uh, so, so thoroughly saturated. There's not enough oxygen in there. I don't know. I've never, I've never heard of a, of, a, of a fuel gauge, of a fuel tank igniting because of a, of a spark in there. Apparently, whatever spark there is just is too weak to, to do anything. But the sedans from that time, Y-types, um, Z-types, had fuel gauges. So a fuel gauge is a voltmeter on your dashboard. Uh, and then there's a, a wire wound resistor uh, or potentiometer rheostat in the tank with a float on it. And the, um, the, there's an arm that sweeps over, over this uh, series of windings. If you take an MGB fuel sending unit apart from a 74 MGB, it looks like there's two or 300 turns of resistance wire around a little bakelite piece and there's a little arm that sweeps on it. Most often when those quit, you can, you can fix them. The new ones have only got 50 turns. So they, they don't, they're not as, as precise as, as the earlier ones were. So, but there's precision and there's accuracy and, and hardly any of them are really accurate. Um, you know, it's, once you get to a quarter tank, it's like better fill up, you know, you, you're, never, you're never sure where down there you're really going to find empty unless you've already found it once and don't want to go there again. So the 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 um, the fuel gauges are are just voltmeters. So that means that when you're at idle, the voltage is is depressed, so it's going to read a little lower. It means when you stop and the gasoline's sloshing around in the tank and the floats bobbing up and down, that the fuel gauge is swinging back and forth. So around uh, 68, they came up with a compensated, but before that, maybe 64, came up with a compensated, that's what they call a compensated gauge that moves very slowly, and it runs off a stable voltage of 14 volt, uh, excuse me, 10 volts. They, do the, they, uh, they, they provide that 10 volts through a voltage stabilizer, which is mechanical. It's a little bimetal strip that heats up, breaks, cools, reconnects, heats up, breaks, cools, re makes a contact. And if you put a test light on uh, the, the wire that goes to the fuel sending unit, ground it, you'll see that that light. It's not as, as, uh, as on off as a, as a uh, turn signal. It winks and trembles and winks rapidly and then doesn't wink again for a while. But over an average time, over a minute, you you if you were able to, to do it um, and you said, well, how often do I have battery voltage and how often don't I? Then the average would be 10 volts. The new voltage stabilizers have got a Z, uh, Zener diode in them and they just put out 10 volts. They're really constant. So the fuel gauge never goes bad. These are rules. I just, of course, a gauge has gone bad, but I don't remember having encountered one. Um, but sure, they, they go bad. Um, it's always the fuel sending unit that goes bad, or sometimes it's the ground. So it's, 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 uh, it's hard on, an, on a later model MGB not to have a ground on the gas tank. But an earlier MGB is trapped in, in, uh, in it, it, it was some straps. And the way it grounds is through a copper line that goes to the fuel pump, which is grounded. So if you got rid of that copper line that goes from the tank to the fuel pump, to put a filter in there, which is the wrong place to put a fuel filter. Or the line's fractured and you put a piece of hose in there, you lose your ground and your fuel gauge doesn't, doesn't work. Now, in an MGA, 
if the fuel gauge isn't working, it reads full. On an MGB, if the fuel gauge isn't working, it reads empty. That is the sending unit if it's, uh, if it's an open circuit. So they work oppositely. The temp gauge. The temp gauge up through 1968 and through almost the very end of the, of the Spridgets um, is a, what they call the safety gauge. Uh, it's a combination unit. Uh, you got you got oil pressure on top and temperature on the bottom. And the earlier ones are calibrated, you know, um, either in Celsius or, or Fahrenheit. But they'll say, you know, 160, 180, 200, 220. And then later on, they decided that they really didn't need to be that accurate because if you're trying to be that accurate, it costs more. So they're CNH gauges, cold, normal, hot. Um, but they're mechanical gauges. There's a bulb that screws into the cylinder head. That bulb has got ether in it or some compound that smells mostly of ether. And as the, as the engine warms up, that, that ether expands and there's a Bernoulli tube in the in the um, in the gauge with little, little uh, uh, gears on it and everything, and it's a pressure gauge. So what you're really reading on the dash is pressure, the pressure of the ether in the system. So that that line, if it gets cut or fractured, you smell the ether for a moment. You go, "What's that?" That's about 150 bucks to have your gauge rebuilt. You can buy new ones. Um, but that those old old original um, gauges are are just great. They work, and when they when they fail, you can have them repaired. Um, that's pretty easy. Then later, 1968 to 1980, on the B's, uh, it's a it's a um, again a voltmeter in the dash, powered by the voltage stabilizer, and then you've got a resistor unit in the cylinder head. And the hotter it gets, the, the lower the, the um, resistance is, and, and the higher the gauge reads. So those sending units, GTR 103, GTR 101, um, have been, for years, have been made incorrectly, and all the gauges read high. Um, that, I, that may be sorted out now. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, and I don't do enough work now and don't have an ordered one and don't know, but for a long time, they were they 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 were just made incorrectly and had the wrong resistance rating to them, and there wasn't much you could do to them. You could put a resistor in line, um, but then when uh, then it would read normal. But then when it was supposed to read hot, it would only read slightly over normal. So that that wasn't very helpful. Anyway, um, again, the gauge never goes bad. It's always the sending unit. And once in a blue moon, it's the wiring. But the gauges in both those cases, the fuel and the temperature, hardly hardly ever fails. Oil pressure gauges, the rule is they never they never fail. They're always accurate. They're always great. The mechanical gauges. So we've got a mechanical oil pressure gauge from the TC. I don't know much about pre-war cars, um, um, but from the TC all the way up through 1967, and then in 70 uh, 71. I think we pick up the uh, the mechanical um, um, oil pressure gauge again. Um, but for a couple of years, 68, 69, 70, maybe 71, we've got an electric oil pressure gauge on the B. And those always read incorrectly. <laughs> it's just, and they just, they just read incorrectly. So if you've got a 68 through 71 or so uh, with an electric oil pressure gauge, and you're doing a lot of work to the car, and you're gonna have the dash out. Oh my gosh, find a mechanical gauge and put that back in there because that is that is what you want. And then you'll get an accurate reading. MGC is too. MGC is used the use that um, electric oil pressure. John? Yes. I remember you telling me about the oil filter. On this, um, yes. I, w I went to go look at a car in Connecticut one time, and the guy said to me, um, we're having a problem with the oil pressure. And I said, um, well, this guy I know, John Twist, told me, make sure you got the right size filter, because if it's too short, it's going to bottom out on the on the uh, 
on the um, yep. oil, right? Right? Yes. And that's what was wrong. He had the wrong size filter. Yeah, I, I run into that every couple of months. Somebody will call and, and say, you know, they, you know, they say my oil pressure is bad. And of course, I, I earlier in the discussion, I said, you know, back up, back up a, a couple of steps and say, well, how long has it been bad? Well, since my oil, <laughs> since my oil change, you go, OK, all right. So what kind of filter do you have on there? So, yeah. Anyway, that's that that is a fact. That's a fact. Thanks. Thanks, Guido. So. <clears throat> We've got a turn signal circuit on the car. Um, the T-types have got that vacuum. If you got that vacuum switch on there that that uh, goes through a, a pair of double throw, double throw relays so that you can get two filaments in the back of the car to do three things. It's a real cumbersome unit. By 1959, the MGA 1600. Now we get three filaments in the back to do three things, tail lights, stop lights, and turns. We don't need that that uh, that complicated box on the YT. On the YT, um, they have an elementary form of that uh, of that relay box, so that when you step on the brakes, uh, the front turn signals light up also, so, along with the brake lights in the back. Anyway, um, the turn signal the turn signal switch the vacuum switch. Um, it, those are repairable sometimes. Um, if, if you've got a, a bulb which is out, uh, instead of the lights winking, they'll, they'll seem to come on and, and maybe the inside indicator will wink real fast, blink, 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 and that lets you know that one of the bulbs isn't working, the bulb's burned out or you've got bad wiring to it or something. All of, all of our cars work so much better with an EL12 or an EL13 flasher unit, uh, de depending on whether you've got um, um, a, th a three prong, a three prong flasher or a two prong flasher, the earlier cars have got a three prong flasher, so they send a different signal to the dash. Later on, they just wired the dash lights in with the with the left turns and the right turns. It seems to make a whole lot more sense to do it that way. They discovered that. Um, but prior to that, in the, on the very earliest MGBs and all the MGAs, um, there's a separate circuit that uses that that three prong that three prong um, turn signal. But an EL12 or an EL13 from Napa, um, all it doesn't matter if you get one bulb or 40 bulbs in line, it always winks at the same rate. They're just great. It's conflict and technology, you know, you got you got a you got a um, a, a unit with a printed circuit in it in your MG, and they're and they're all um, negative ground when you buy them from Napa. You can buy a positive ground one from uh, from Moss, um, but why would you keep your car positive ground if you're going to put a um, electronics in it? Anyway, um, the turn circuit, uh, the the switch up on the dash, or the, the the turn signal switch up on the column, on the earlier MGBs. The column has to be in the right place. There's a little, a little uh, funny little bolt thing that sticks out of the out of the side of the column, and, and there's uh, there's some grippers here. So if you've got your turn signals on, and, and you and you turn you turn the, uh, the the wheel, it'll come up and kick it. Um, or turn it the other way, it'll kick it back to uh, to off to to the neutral position. So that's really difficult when you're when you're if it's in the wrong place, you got to take the whole steering column loose. Oh my gosh, what a hassle! From '68 onwards, there's just a wraparound deal on the on the uh, steering column that you can move with a screwdriver, so you can get the the turn signals to to cancel correctly. Um, it's pretty hard to to repair a turn signal switch. Pretty hard to repair a wiper switch. You can do it if you've got the patients of Job, <laughs> they're they're uh, they're plastic, and if you if some of the little pieces on it are broken, they're just there's no way out. You can either get an, an original used one, um, or you can you can buy a new one. Hey John, yeah, this is this is Crystal in Central yeah. Texas. Yes. Uh, stupid question on the uh, seventy MGB to get to that. I know what you're talking about. Uh, the 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 little the lever that the kicks canceler? it on and off. Yeah. 
But how do you get the horn or that center rubber part off without ripping that inner part that seals it in, pulls it in? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, just take. Can't you just take the center out? Can't you, isn't there is isn't that got a isn't that got a couple pieces? You got the ring ring around the outside, and then in the center there's an MG motif. You get a little tiny screwdriver underneath that motif and pop that out, so that you can get you can get a a, a socket on that and pop the steering wheel off, so you, you can get that get that aligned. Well, that whole rubber portion that on most cars is the horn, but on my car. The actual uh, turn signal is the horn, right? Right. Uh, I've noticed by me pulling that rubber cover off, it's starting to rip the inner ring that holds it in. Okay. But the center, it, it, it's not one great big piece. Isn't there an MG motif right in the middle of that rubber piece? There's an, M, there's an MG motif in the middle, okay, but that's so, glued on. Well, okay. All right, I'll check to see if it's glued or not. Okay. It's all one piece in my car. Okay. I got my eyes, I always, always have my eyes closed. I'm trying to see this. It's like the, the earlier ones. I, I know I know those come off so you can get to the nut so you can pop the steering wheel off so you, you can adjust the canceler. Um, so, Crystal, you can... Send me a picture of your steering wheel tomorrow, and uh, uh, let me just a picture of the wheel. It you you got the holes in the wheels, the the holes in the spokes. Yep, I got holes in the spokes. Yep. Okay. Okay. And I mean, I've taken it off several times now to okay. because I need to adjust the steering wheel so that when I'm straight, the spokes are yes. aligned right. And Correct. I've taken that off several times, but by pulling it off so many times, oh, I'm okay. starting to get a rip okay. on that inside rubber okay. lip that's holding okay. it in. Okay. Okay. I, I I make a picture every time I'm here. There there isn't just one place out there. There's there's a bunch of them, but my favorite is my favorite is a sports car craftsman in. Denver, Colorado. Talk to Ian out there, or Paul, if he's in, and uh, they have everything used, new original equipment used, and it's it's they they won't send you something that's broken. They'll send you something that's nice. They're they're very responsive. That's not the only place out there, um, um, but that's okay. that certainly one. All right. Okay, I was just thinking maybe there sure. was a trick. Of some type of lever to put in there, and then send me send me a picture. Of it. Send me a picture of that tomorrow. I just it seems to me that that whole center pops out, and that you can get a uh, you can get your socket in there. But I hey, just okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Your silicone spray. Yeah, hey, that all that kind of stuff helps. It sure can. Oh, Judd's yeah. got a picture of the attack box. <laughs> And so that's an unusual background to have there. Um, well, you were talking about it. So I thought it was I, yeah, four point. The, the ratio on that is four point three to one. I that stamped someplace on the outside cover. Um, the, the the turn signal switch, the turn signal switch sixty eight through eighty, doesn't directly control that. Well, it does directly control the turn signals, but to power up the switch. Um, the the power comes through the hazard light switch. So the hazard light switch is an integral part of the turn signals. It's not uncommon after having used the hazards, um, intentionally or unintentionally, snap the switch on, to have the turn signals not come on at all. And uh, they, you know, you turn the turn signals on, nothing happens. So you're scrabbling around trying to find the flasher unit, all this kind of stuff. But but if the light doesn't come on at all and the turn signals left or right, snap the hazards on and then use a stiff index finger and snap that hazard switch off. And if it doesn't work, snap it off again. And if it doesn't work, snap it off again. And if you have to, snap it off 50 or 100 times and the turn signals will start to work again. So the, the, uh, the, the connections get corroded on the hazard switch, but the hazard switch is an integral part of the turn signal circuit, 68 through 80. 
77 through 80, you don't want to hit that hazard switch very hard with your finger because it'll it'll fall apart worse than it's already fallen apart. Just had a call the other day. A guy said, how can I make it work? I said, pull the plug off the back and jump the two green wires. And then your your, your hazards aren't going to work, um, but your, at least your, your turn signals will. will. The, um, the wiper circuit on a T-type is pretty easy. It, it comes off the control box and and you got the two speed wipers, too slow or too fast, almost always too slow. Um, it's just an on off switch. Um, but by the, by the MGA, you've got, you've got self parking, oh boy. Uh, and that's adjustable on the motor itself, little can on top of the motor. You can have it park anywhere, have it park straight up if you want. Most everybody would have it park, park over um, you know, on the left. Um, but that is, that is adjustable on the, on the motor. The motor's wired hot, the switch grounds the motor and uh, runs the motor until you push the switch off and then, and then the motor self grounds until it gets back to its park position. So that's a, that's a pretty easy circuit. Prior to the, to the um, voltage regulator that, that we know of on the TC and TD and TF and MGA, Prior to that, there, there was not a voltage regulator. There was only a cutout. And you yourself, while driving, had to keep, you had to be aware of the rate of charge. And if it was charging too little, you had to turn your headlamp switch to uh, too high so that, the, so that the, the generator would charge more. Or if it was charging too much, you had to turn it back to L, low, um, so it was it, it was uh, something you had to constantly monitor. So you neither would run the battery flat nor boil the battery from overcharging. Therefore, there was an ammeter in the circuit. Why they continued the ammeter in the TC and the TD and the TF, I haven't a clue. It's not helpful. It's dangerous. It's a it's a if something if something arcs. Oh boy! I mean, it's a it's a direct connection right to the right to the battery, and and there can be a there can be a lot of trouble with it. Never ever ever install an ammeter in your car, an aftermarket ammeter. A voltmeter is completely different. TR sixes have got voltmeters. Expect to if it's hooked up to your fuse box, expect to see a reading of around fourteen volts when you're running down the road. Um, but the ammeter was finally dropped. It was just an antiquated, unnecessary piece. And instead, we've got the ignition warning light. So the ignition warning light comes on when you turn the key on. And then when you exceed around 1,000 RPM or so, the ignition warning light goes out to let you know that the generator is making, uh, making enough electricity to recharge the battery. Usually, that's what it means, like 99.99% .99 of the time. Sometimes the ignition warning light can go out and you're not charging the battery, but those are those are bizarre, um, bizarre things. But that that ignition warning light, it's a red light, and uh, you pay attention to it because if you don't and it's glowing or it's on while you're driving, your battery's not being recharged, and you'll end up someplace flat dead. Starting in 1968, there's the brake failure warning light. So it, it shows up on the left-hand side of the dash, and it's a push button. You can push it to test it, to see if it's working. Um, by 1974, the government didn't trust you to test it anymore, so they put a diode in the circuit. So when you turn the key over to start, the, the brake warning light lamp would illuminate to let you know that, yes, it was working. 77 through 80, it's, it's the bottom uh, uh, bottom second to the bottom, um, rectangle light um, between the the, uh, the tack and the speedo, but that lights up to let you know it's working. And then if it comes on while you're, while you're braking, that's an indication that there's a difference in hydraulic pressure between the front and rear brake circuits to let you know that the brakes are faulty if you didn't already realize it because your foot's almost on the floor. So that's a that's been rendered inoperative on a lot of cars. I'm not sure it's really helpful. Um, usually you can tell, I mean, the brakes are either right there or there's a problem with them. Um, but that's the brake, uh, the brake 
failure switch. So I just wanted to go over all that. That's just the dash, the instruments, and the clocks, and so forth, and and uh, all hey, other, other stuff. Yeah. John, this is Judd. Uh, yeah. Before you leave the uh, ignition warning light, a lot of us are enamored of uh, LEDs for a lot of things, and they brighten up your dash and they make you have to buy a new kind of flasher for your turn signals. But one thing they don't do is they don't work in the ignition warning light because no. that and a lot of people have put the LEDs in their dash and put it in the ignition warning light place and suddenly nothing works. So that's got to be an incandescent bulb, or I guess you could just replace it with a resistor of some sort. All right. Incandescent bulb, 987. Yep, hardware store. Last bulb. forever. Yes. Yep. Well, interestingly, on a on a TR, this is not a TR discussion, but on a TR6, the um, there's only one uh, turn signal lamp on the dash. The turn signals are flashing or not. I mean, what 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 difference if you put on the left turn signal? What you, you the right the right one's going to start winking? Well, it might if you get the wiring wrong. But um, anyway, the um, the individual lamps on an MG are are hooked into the circuit, the left circuit or the right circuit, and the other side of the lamp on the on the uh, dash is grounded. Simple circuit, power goes into the bulb, lights it up, and then it grounds on the other side. But on the TR6, um, that bulb. Uh, is is connected um, between the left and right circuits. So if you've got the right turn signals on, it grounds into the left circuit, which isn't being worked, and there's plenty of ground there, enough to light the ball, unless you have an LED, and then it only lights up in one direction. So, and that's where I was going with that. There's, there's some weird stuff with LEDs, but the only places I know are ignition warning lights and, and TR6 uh, turn signals. I had a guy just just berate me. I didn't do due diligence when I test drove his car before he picked it up, but he brought it back and he was howling mad that his his uh, his turn signal warning light didn't work on the other side. So we pulled it out and put the original ball back in. And I'm not sure he's happy, um, but he did leave. <laughs> I wonder if that would be the same thing on the T where you only have a single bulb indicator for the no, turn signal. No, because that has got a third pin. Right, oh, on the, on the flasher. Right. So in, in the other side of that circuit goes to ground. Gotcha. John? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a, uh, when I was changing my dashboard and all that stuff, I, I couldn't find the lens. The lens was cracked for the red light for the alternator, so I changed it with an LED that looks like a little battery and a 25 ohm uh, resistor in parallel, and it works fine. Oh, okay, all right. I'm putting it in parallel, it would. Yep. Okay. John, on your temperature gauges. It doesn't affect any of that. Yeah, but on the temperature gauge, the you should mention on the on the normal setting on that gauge, if you change your thermostat, the the needle raise reads differently, it reads higher or lower depending on what temperature gauge you use. Of course, of course. So the normal range, you know, I mean, if you got one that's calibrated. To, 170, 180, 190, you buy a 195 thermostat and the most you can get out of it's 180. It's because the new thermostats aren't made well. Um, I was talking to Glenn at Glenn's MG service in Florida. He said, he, well, after we got done complaining about the quality of the thermostats not opening at the rated temperature, then he also told me that the, that the caps, the radiator caps, you know, that might be rated for seven pounds. It might blow off at two. It might blow off at 12. There's a real, there's a real supply problem. Everybody's experiencing this. But the sending unit from the engine is also different for what, for the higher or lower thermostats. Right. So if you want to make sure that the thermostat is, is, uh, is operating correctly before you put it in your car, wait till your wife's gone, go on and put it on the stove with a, with a thermometer and, and, uh, and warm up the temperature and see where it actually opens. But yeah, and, and some, some, it depends, every now and then with, a, with the old fashioned, with that old fashioned safety gauge, those, those can be pretty, uh, pretty precise and, and you'll see them come down and then after a little bit, they go back up. 
and then they come back down and that's the third that's the thermostat opening and closing you can actually see it on the on the gauge while you're driving that's correct and i know on mine i had a 195 thermostat in the car and it read almost hot on the gauge and then i ch changed it to a 180 and it read closer to the normal then the sending unit that goes into the block is a different sending unit for the 185 or for the 195 too they're color coded okay interesting that we always used to use just a gtr what year is your car 70 70, 70. Yeah, we used to use a GTR 103 for everything. So that's interesting. I, I, okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. I didn't know that. Where, where are those available? They don't make a differentiation in the Moss catalog. Do they on those? I brought them from the regular auto parts store. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. John. Yes. I have a question. Uh, 1970 MGB. It's uh, Jimmy Antis in Indiana, PA. Um, my ignition warning light comes on from time to time, and then it goes off. Uh, my generator has been rebuilt. Uh, the belt is adjusted correctly. 90% of the time, the light is off, but every once in a while, it will come on. This and is then it will go off again. This is it, it will go off again. The 1970, what what year, what what model? 1970 MGB, GT. That's got an alternator, right? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, I would say... Or the alternator it, has been rebuilt. Not, I'm sorry. Right. I said generator. You did, alternator. you did. That's why I asked you about the year again. Um, sorry. I would, I would say, because, because everything is controlled on the back of the alternator there, the regulator, is on the back of the alternator. Something's up back there. A, a crummy connection? Don't know. Something. Something's going on within the alternator itself. That's where the problem lies. Okay, I'll take a look. My battery is not going dead, uh, so okay. I'll take a look at those connections. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey question. John, I had that same problem, and it was. Uh, I, I, what it is, I went to LED for my alternator, my 77B, and the light would go up. And then I realized after some research that the LED does not put out enough for that to uh, energize that alternator. So I went back to my old light and it works fine. This is that alternators and the Bs, when you put an LED, does not generate enough power for the to ignite it. The the Lucas alternators are self-energizing. Well, they're supposed to be. And so it, they, it, they don't have to have, they don't have to have any ignition um, electricity coming to them uh, to make them work. But, but it seems as though, I, I've heard this before. I, I, I've heard this before. So yeah, like, like Judd said um, a couple of times ago there, it just, yeah, leave, leave an incandescent bulb uh, in that in that ignition warning light, that's that's the best thing. Yeah, can I make a comment? Yes, I, I saw on a replacement alternator. It's a it's a Lucas lookalike, but it's not Lucas. But um, the the nut that holds the um, diode pack onto the back, it's kind of against the block, um, was loose, and it was it was losing power. So you yeah. have to have a good ground on that thing. Make sure that nut is tight because tighten it up and work just fine. Yep. Well, that's what that's what's going on with with the with the gentleman who who complained that it comes on every now and then. Something's loose in it. Something you're you're losing a, a connection someplace. So and and Lucas alternators do not like loose connections. The the that ruins the it ruins the diodes. It ruins the 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 regulator. Um, you want to make sure everything is tight and fast. And and uh, I I go back to I go back to a, a Catholic priest who threw a fan belt on his MGB in Detroit, and um, and they put I took it to someplace and had a new fan belt installed. The car was running just like crap, and he drove it. He did he didn't trust him. He says if they screw that screw that up and it runs crummy, I'm just going to go back to University Motors and have them. Uh, take care of it, and I open up the bonnet, and the friggin' ignition wire is dangling. 
And I, so I put it on the spark plug and I told the guy, I said, you know, you, well, I don't know anything about cars. I said, well, okay, but you know, you could have opened the bonnet and you could have looked and, and I mean, three out of four got wires on them. And there's an empty wire there. You could have put that wire on yourself. So even if you don't know a lot about alternators, you can take the cover off. There aren't springs and balls underneath. It's not going to pop apart and just snug up all the connections. That's it, it's just as easy as that. Try that. Okay. Another thing there is the connector uh, to the back of the alternator. I've seen where it got so hot because of a loose connection that it melted all the solder off of there. And um, it was making a good contact between the Lucar connector and the wire. So just check that too. There's a really bizarre one. I saw it a couple of times where that, that Lucar connector, you know, it's folded around where it slips on and it got hot. You could tell from the coloration. It hadn't lost the solder, but it, it lost the connection. So the ignition warning light would go out because it's up to 14 volts, but no power was coming out, out, of the, out of the back. It wasn't getting back. And so even though the ignition warning light was acting correctly, the battery was going dead. So there, there are bizarre little things on that, but boy, there's nothing like a physical inspection. Just look at it. Does it look burned up? Is it loose? You know, tighten it up, you know. Hey, John? Yes. Hey, um, can we go back to the mechanical oil pressure gauge? Quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, I had a slight oil leak and it was leaking at the gauge or at, the, at, at that fitting. Um, when I went to replace I pulled it off and went to replace the leather washer that's in there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can't see or work back there and lost it three times before I finally lost it. I put in a nitro O-ring instead. Is that acceptable or should I go oh, yeah. back and fight with sure. the thing? No, that, no, that, oh, that's, that's fine. That's okay. fine. What, on the, on the car that's pictured behind you? Yes. How the hell did you get your hands up in there? Oh my gosh, that is the that, you, that, you, that, that is the singly most difficult job, I think, in that except changing the well, you can change you, the you, pressure, the, you can change the third, fourth lockout switch for the overdrive. It just takes yeah. half a day. Um, but you can do it. But that up behind there, last time I did it, well, I changed the guy's 68 or 69 over to a mechanical. I had to drop the steering column. I couldn't get up in there. I think I, I had to. I, I did two things. I had to drop the steering column and I also took the tack out. Yep. And yep. it was still, you just couldn't get your hand up there and hold that nut. And yep. it, it was, it was, it was about a two hour and maybe a pint of blood job. Kind of. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. When yeah. the same thing you have to do, if you want to replace the bulb in <laughs> one of those gauges up there. <laughs> so the trick, let me just go on a little further on what, uh, John said here, and that if you're if you're working with the the choke cable bulbs and so forth on a on an MGB, and you've got the heater controls um, next to the steering column, uh, 68, 68 through seventy six, take those controls out of the dash. You need a deep five eight socket and a little prick punch to to pull the knob off, but just pull those out and let them dangle. Then you can get your hand up in there. Well, it's still difficult, but it's not its not impossible. That's you, you, don't, you, you don't go to a high school re reunion with scars on your wrist and have your, have your old classmates start to stare at you. you know? my, my, trick, my trick, sorry, my, my trick is uh, teaching my 50-year-old daughter to fit <laughs> and to screw the little... The little uh, twists <laughs> and okay, you know, thank you very much, and and then they finish. But yeah, a little nuts. Nice. I, 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 Rodolfo, I apologize for not responding to your. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Call, call, call me tomorrow. Oh, um, that I, I had that. I had that with with my um with my daughter's MGB GT. I was underneath the car trying to get just the bolts in, in the in the cross in the, in the gearbox from the cross member overdrive. And myself, and I was working with another guy. We both had some pretty good sized hands, and combinations of screwdrivers and pliers and 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 uh, um, grippers. We could not do it, and I was just cursing up a storm. And my daughter said, "Well, what are you trying to do?" I said, "I'm trying to get this bolt in here." And she said, "Well, I'll do it." I said, "We well, can't do it. You're a girl." So that was enough to get her down on her back and. And uh, just within 15 seconds, it was started. I mean, when it started, I, I was able to get it in. But if you can get someone who's younger with 
who's more uh, oh, small hands, yeah, yeah, small hands and thinner. Yeah, it, it can sure make a difference. Hey, John. Yes, sorry. Uh, fast question on the um, 80 MGB. Uh, I bought one of those cigarette lighter voltmeters, digital voltmeter. Okay. Um, what I find is that there are times where the battery charge is 13.6, 13.7, and there are other times when it doesn't charge. It's like uh, 10, 11, 12. Uh, batteries never, you know, never fails. Um, I have no problems with it. But what would cause that much of a fluctuation? The only thing I can imagine is being at idle or being at speed. But if you're running down the road at, at 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden it falls back to 10 volts. I'm surprised the ignition warning light doesn't come back on. But you know, at idle, no, it at idle it's always gonna come back down to battery voltage. Okay, so uh, could it be a connector to the uh, alternator? It could be anything. It could be a thousand things, yes. But you, you're having this at speed, what you're watching it at, you know, when you're driving at 30 miles no. an hour. No, not not really. But uh, what happened is I also put in a cutoff switch. Would that contribute to, to that kind of situation? Oh, probably not. If the starter motor is working okay, those are real heavy duty connections. Probably not. But man, if you're chasing if you're chasing an ignition charging problem, you start at the battery and you you make sure the battery posts are clean, the battery clamps are tight. The wires to the clamps are tight. The ground connection's tight. You take the, the boot off the starter. You take all the wires off the starter solenoid, tighten up the, the, the lug on the starter solenoid, put all the wires back on, put the washer and nut back on there, pull the wire off the back of the alternator, pop the connectors out of the plastic plug, the little barbs in there. You have to look in there and see how to do that with a really tiny little screwdriver. Pinch the pinch the connectors just a little bit more. After you've done all that, then then see what happens. Okay, I, I, I think you said that you weren't having a charging problem, just your meter fluctuating, right? Correct. So so the because it's plugged into a cigarette lighter in the console, um, those are notorious for having a, a flaky connector, just a push on connector on the back say. of the of the. Uh, cigarette lighter and the ground could be bad too right basically that could be an issue as well yeah thank so you get, get behind the uh, cigarette lighter uh, female part and just make sure yeah. all the water yeah if thank you're not you. having a charging problem put it in the glove box and put the cigarette lighter back back in there and don't look at it that's another thing. I'll just put some tape over it. Well, that's the that's the joke with MGA owners who are who are washing their their uh, their their water temperature gauges. Because oh my gosh, if you're if you're in really warm weather, that temperature gauge will get up to you know two twelve, two twenty. Sometimes it'll climb all the way up to a hundred pounds of oil pressure. The needle will go as long as the car is running, as long as long as it's not blow, blowing out coolant at speed. Um, you're you're okay. You're okay. And so my advice to some MGA owners sometimes, tongue in cheek, is put a piece of tape on the uh, on the temp gauge. Just don't don't even worry about it. You know. So, but yeah, uh, I, I guess that would work. Uh, one other question: I have you uh, on my temperature gauge. It usually uh, I put an electric oversized electric fan. I think it was a 16 inch fan on there, electric fan, and the thing is running. Pretty well. I'm not losing any free any uh, any antifreeze or anything like that. I'm down in Florida, um, so it doesn't go into the normal stage. It's below the normal stage, more normal setting. Um, car runs well, starts well. So, uh, should I consider it, that to be an issue? No, no. And uh, if, if you mentioned that first, I, I would have immediately talked about the accuracy of the gauge first because it's just temp gauges temp gauges are, are notoriously um inaccurate so okay. uh, you know it, it just it's as long as you're not having a problem driving it you're not losing coolant it starts you're fine yeah are, are you near uh, tampa st pete no i'm for the south i'm down uh okay. broward broward uh, right. okay okay so 
it's quite hot here, but the car runs well, you know, mid afternoon is no problem. And since I have you at the same time, so I can save uh, issue before, I do have another issue with the speedometer. Uh, when I turn at times, everything is, you know, sporadic. Uh, I turn the ignition switch on, the needle buried itself into the, into the red zone, all the way down to the extreme red zone. The tachometer it, you're talking about. Yes. Yes. Um, and then after I'm driving down the road a while, it'll fluctuate back and forth, then drop to 1,000 RPM or 1,500, whatever the whatever gear yeah, I'm that's, in. That's the, that's the unit itself. That's, that's, the, unit. that's the unit itself. And, and when it drives you too crazy, uh, you can either get a good used one, or they're real easy to change, um, or um, or you could have yours rebuilt. But I don't even know. I don't know if the if the instrument guys even re rebuild those real late model tacks. Um, but you could find out. We, so we just get that problem, and you just uh, buy a used one and put it in. Okay, yeah. so it, it, it's it, it's the actual uh, gauge itself, as opposed to um, something else. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You Thank you so much. You can have the gauge. Uh, have a new, um, a modern unit put into the gauge. It'll look just like the original, but it'll have a modern unit behind it. Once again, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah. You know, the the rebuilders, if you want it to be accurate, you can just have them put a modern unit in the back of the the tachometer. It'll look just oh, as oh. original, but it'll have a modern mechanism in behind. I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so I can do that. Good, that good, a good use of it would be <clears throat> probably less expensive. But yeah, a lot of people do that with speedometers. You can get a, a GPS speedometer um, and, and until the Chinese shoot down all, all, all the satellites. Um, we should be we should be fine. Although Judd will tell you because he's always out on the weekends driving these snaky up and down hills and so forth. Um, that uh, the the GPS isn't quite as good when you're when you're doing up and down and around, but you're on uh, you're on on seashell, pretty flat seashell ground there. So I would think that the GPS and, and, would work well there. Right, right. Thank you so much. I appreciate. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, can I make just a general question? Well, here, um, uh, yeah, Rudolph, go, go ahead. Then, then one we'll minute, it, it's a one minute question. Yeah. Um, as you know, I live in Mexico and I have to drive uh, almost two and a half hours to the border and then cross to Texas to get to a, a Napa or O'Reilly or any other uh, place to buy uh, spare parts. Uh, in Mexico, we have the AutoZone, but I don't trust the, the catalog because I bought uh, some uh, pieces and, and they don't fit. So in order, uh, seeing that, I have to be very precise uh, when, uh, if if I am not uh, buying from Moss in England or whatever. Uh, it's a lot, of, uh, it's more expensive. So can you recommend me at least one place where all, I had the problem that you said with the oil filter, and then my gauge start going. I, I'm guessing that's what happened to me. So, is any trusty any any store that is uh, trustworthy? Well, I like Napa. Napa is not you know Napa is, but again, it's you know people they it's 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 so hard if if you got if you got something you're hunting for. Specifically, you can you can uh, you can call me or text me, and I, I can talk to you a little bit about it. You know some particular part, and um, um, almost almost always the you know I mean just almost always the part you buy from from Moss or Northwest uh, Auto or uh, Northwest uh, um, Import uh, those kinds of places. There there I mean every now and then there there's there's some crummy stuff, but. Um, and people seem to get focused on that, but th that's really, really, um, those are good places. Whether you got to have them my best bet. delivered in, in Texas and then drive up there and get them or something. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, Mike, hey, John. John. Mike. Oh, Mike. Yeah, Mike. I, I wasn't going to chime in or not, but you mentioned the uh, sending units and temperature locks. I wanted to give you some actual facts. 
that I ended up with, not conjecture facts. Um, I have put a new radiator and cooling system up, you know, update or not upgrade, but a replacement in my 72 MGB and uh, uh, ended up with a meter pegging almost close to hot, which had me concerned, put an hour uh, infrared thermometer on it, read about 185 to 109 thermostat. I had a 195 thermostat in it. So obviously I started suspecting the sending unit, just like you mentioned. So this is not conjecture. This is fact of a few years ago. Uh, the Moss catalog, and I'm not picking on Moss, they're a good vendor, but they showed the correct thermostat for my, or sending unit for my car is a 760-180 what some people call the red top unit. I changed that out to a 131.565 part number, which they now have replaced with another number. It looks like a 131.566. And when I replaced it from a black top to a black, a red top to a black top sending unit, my temperature went down to where it now read a little bit to the right of north, or north normal, excuse me, the end. And even driving the dog crap out of it, I never got it anymore between halfway between N and H. So, uh, and I did bring that to Kelvin's attention at the time in a September 19th, 2018 uh, post on MG Experience. So again, not hacking on Moss, but you are correct. There is a real problem out there with sending units for MGs. If you look up on the Moss catalog now, the fitment for the, uh, I'm looking at it right now, the 76180, is the sending unit for a 67 to 76 MGB. And I can tell you, if you put that sucker in, you're going to be pegged to the H or darn near. Well, they changed the sending units. Um, there, there was one sending unit, 68 through 76, and another sending unit, uh, 77 through 80, a GTR 103 and a GTR 101. And they're in... I always found them indistinguishable. I mean, it was really, uh, maybe they're something. But anyway, now it's, it sounds like they're color-coded. They are. And um, so that that's, I, thanks. And, and you found for your car, the best one was the black top. Uh, uh, the black top, yes. The red top is still called out in the Moss catalog. I'm looking at it right now. It is, it is called out for the 68 through 76. And I can promise you, unless they've made changes to that unit, you will read either H or right near H and think the sucker's running hot. I changed it to a black top. I've even got the resistance values, but I didn't want to plug up the chat with a bunch of a bunch of stuff. But I even well, made it, those, thing, with those it things off. run those things run from about 15, 15 to ninety ohms, don't they? Around there, something I think. You're, I'm not saying you're you're absolutely correct. I'm sure. I even put them in the old uh, pot on the stove deal when my wife was gone and got measurements. And uh, <laughs> I, I can tell you that I measured the temperatures at the upper hose, lower hose, sending in location, and the the uh, where the thermostat sits. And basically, uh, if you got a black a red unit in there and it reads close to H, I'm gonna raise the bullshit flag that it's not running hot. I put a black one in there, use the same IR meet, uh, readings, and it read a little bit to the right of uh, N. And if I really run the dog crap out of it, it runs between N and H. But hey, I'm running 75 miles an hour and kicking it hard. So I'm okay for it running a little warmer and hot weather. But if you if you put the red one in there, which is still called for on Moss's website, I'm not saying the values didn't change, but that sucker is not the right one. And I even brought their attention at the time, with three pages of data, I'm not saying Moss isn't responsive, but they're still calling for it in their catalog. Yeah. So do with that information as you will. Hey, Mr. Mr. MK, you're on. No, you're not. We get it's too too garbled. So, do we have hey, some? John. Yes. Yeah, I. I had put a question in the chat, but I had to drop off. And so if you've oh, already okay. answered it, you don't need to answer it again. But I've got a 62B, uh, a really early one with the Jaeger gauges. Yeah. And um, my apparently my capillary got cracked for my uh, coolant temperature. Sure. I can't find. I don't see a crack, but I have no reading anymore. Right. Uh, 
So I was just curious. I, I see you can buy a Jaeger replacement from Rimmer. No, no. To, to get get yours re rebuilt. Okay, I was going to ask, what's the best place to send it well, to get it? Two places I know of. Um, yeah. uh, one is one is in Ohio. John Wolf W O L F F. Okay. Um, that's as much as I know. And then the other place is is um, West Valley Instruments in California. in California. And I don't know if Nisinger is doing those or not. I know they don't. So, do so, they'll, so they'll actually solder a, a totally so they'll, new they'll, capillary. They'll, make, and, and they'll put a whole, whole new tube in it and, and it'll, it'll work. It'll be, it'll be accurate. And it's yours ah. from your car. And the levering, it's, it's yours from your car. Right. So they, they will, they basically, they'll solder the cap, new capillary and bulb to the back right. of the gauge that I send them. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I'll do that then. Thank you. In the for what it's worth department, when Ken Smith, who was uh, uh, the, the uh, Moss Motors uh, promotional guy for years, when he and his wife Barbie came from, from England, they came to work for Nisinger, who was an import um, uh, company that was running up against Moss. They also owned Nisinger Instruments. And, and uh, for the first year that they were here, that's what Barbie did. She she put ether in those tubes and soldered them up. So yeah. In the from hey, John. Yes. Thank you. That um, John Wolf website is antiqueinstruments.com. Thank you. Antiqueinstruments.com. And they're in Ohio. They're in he's in Willoughby, Ohio. He's okay. works alone. He does a lot of gauges for uh, airplanes out of Alaska antique gauges uh and he, he's he's getting up in years i asked him if he was going to retire he says yeah when i fall off the bench yeah well hey, he's very uh, john good. for uh for bob's information on my td the previous owner had apparently gotten tired of the temperature gauge not working so he literally snipped the tube off the back of it <laughs> i sent it to the Hussinger, it came back with a brand the same gauge but with a brand new so the whole long tube and bulb and everything works perfectly. So the, I'm sure the other companies can do it as good. And so send them your gauge and have them put all that stuff back on it. It'll work. How, well. how long ago was that, Judd? Uh, maybe five years. Yeah, because there was a big flood there, and they stopped doing a whole lot of a whole yeah, lot of was... tech and speedo work, but they still may do those safety gauges. They yeah, may so still. This was before the flood, but maybe okay. not very far before it. But just to let Bob know that uh, these people that do that stuff, they can do that. I, uh, that's I've great. Heard of people do it in their garage, and I wouldn't attempt it. Well, I'm originally from Ohio, so I'll, I'll send it to the guy. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Hey, John? Yeah. question. John, there's also a company called British Speedo, and he used to work for Nissinger. He's in New York. Okay. You, Find him on the internet. He rebuilt a couple of my gauges. And as I said, he worked for Nissinger. I think he was the operations manager. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. So yeah, they're they're out there. They're out, out and around. So I, I use a MoMA in Albuquerque. In fact, uh, uh West West Valley uh started that was the Mo of MoMA. And they they separated. He went and made West Valley. So they're they're all good people. Margaret Margaret was the ma. So Margaret, she's passed away now. There's a uh, a a new guy that runs it now. So yeah. Do we have any other okay. questions? We we've had a lot of questions here. It's it's almost eight thirty, and we're we aren't even off uh, we are aren't even off our topic yet. This is a good hit tonight. Hey, John, 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 it's Jim. Yes. Um, the further discussion on the uh, oil gauge on the 68 to 71. Yeah, I have one here that I was working on, and I couldn't get the mechanical gauge to. I'm sorry, the uh, electric gauge to work. I tried everything. If you order the plastic oil gauge line for Moss, th they exist. It comes with two fittings. <clears throat> you take the sending unit off of the bracket <clears throat> throw that little can aside the fitting fits right into 
into the bracket. You run the line through, and I mounted one under the dash, a mechanical one. Sure. Okay. That was twenty bucks. Yep. Got to have yes. an extra gauge. Yes. Yep. Yep. You can always do. Oh, speaking of oil pressure gauges, there's a, the, sometimes, um, sometimes you know, um, on an externally lit, I think they're externally lit gauges. Um, the oil pressure might come up to 30 pounds and then just stop. And it never goes above 30 pounds. So you can't run a car with, uh, under 50 pounds. And the problem isn't that you don't have oil pressure. It's that the, there's a strip on the inside of the gauge, a diffusion strip for the illumination. And sometimes that, that, that tightens up. And, and prohibits the needle from moving. So you can fix that yourself by taking the front of the gauge off and, and, and changing the position of that, that um, diffusion strip. So uh, just an aside. Hey, John, I just uh, Googled um, this uh, British Speedo Service Inc. in New York. Yeah. Uh, I just Google that, and it's, uh, it's an impressive website. If they do have as good on the instruments as they do on their website, I think you'd be all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When you look it up, don't put British Speedo because you get to see a lot of people in Speedos and nobody wants to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but British Speedo service. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Thank you. <laughs> hey, John, a question on tax orders. Can you take that? Sure. Yeah, this is Tim in North Carolina. I've got a 71 MGB. And my tachometer, I've owned the car for 25 years, and my tachometer, um, once every six weeks, will just go just dead. Needle drops from where, wherever it is to zero. <clears throat> it might be off for five minutes. It might be off for two days. It always comes back on. Any idea? Um, well, it could be an internal problem. Could be. But since you always go for the easiest, cheapest, simplest stuff first, you reach up behind there, there's either a green or a white wire that powers it. So pull that off and put it back on. And, and it has to be grounded. Um, so make sure that, that the, the stalks that come off the back of the unit that have got the thumb screws on them and the little legs, make sure that there's a, a ground wire attached to that. Um, that's especially critical to get the, the, the light on the inside of it to work. So that's about it. it. It's not it's not on the power side because the I think you've got a, a white wire going in and a white wire coming out going down to the coil. So that can't be interrupted or else the car wouldn't run at all. Uh, okay. So just do that external stuff and then and then when if it turns out that you can't make it work either by used one or or uh, get yours fixed. Great. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Dash, instruments, anything else? Or I'm going to start on the chat here. We've had we've had a lot of a lot of people, a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of interest here. We still got 161 people on. Oh my gosh! So um, so I I've got um, I've got Brian here and uh, asking about um, in the chat section about. Front wheel bearings. Brian, are, are you still on? Here I am. Okay, all right. So I have a YouTube video up, I can't tell you what number it is, about how to set up front MGB wheel bearings. You have disc wheels or wire wheels? Oh, they're disc. How fortunate. Because um, a wire wheel is just a real bugger. So to keep those taper bearings, you know, if you tighten up the nut tight enough, those bearings get jammed against each other and the hub can't turn. So you don't want it that tight, and it's not an American style where you tighten it up until it locks and back it off to the next pin. Instead, there are shims. There's a spacer and shims that hold those bearings apart, and you've got to buy a shim kit or a, a handful of shims and then experiment. Uh, there's always a 25,000 shim, and then, mm -hmm. and then from there, you've got tens, fives, and threes. And if you have too many shims, it spins freely, but you can take a hold of it and push it in and out of the car and it tunks. You don't want it to tunk. 
You want it to greased up. You want it to spin freely, but not tunk. If you've got a dial indicator with a magnetic base that you can put on the on the brake rotor, you can put the pin from the from the dial indicator against the the stub axle and move it back and forth. And you should have two to three thousandths pen float. So, but you 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 should use the shims. I've seen a lot of them put together. I've never seen a front a front stub axle brake in a non-race car set setting, never seen one break. That, um, except once, once, once when the, there wasn't enough grease up there and the, and the outer bearing turned blue and it, it snapped it off. Um, but um, the proper way to do it is to use the shims. And I do have- It was kind of, was kind of tongue in cheek. You have, yeah, got, I didn't have a discussion with a, with a guy and he said, ah, just snug it up and Back at a half a turn like we used to do, right? On um, every Chevy and Ford. Well, it works. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I was, it was just looking for an opinion. I mean, I'm ready. To, I, I don't need to do them, but um, I just wonder what your thoughts are. So I, I think in my YouTube video, I, I say, look, you take a piece of, of electrical conduit and put it against your knee and pull it real hard, and you can bend it. Okay, take it. Take a piece of threaded rod put it against your knee, pull it, you can bend it. You put that threaded rod through the conduit, put a nut on either end and tighten it up really tight. You can't bend that, not for love or money because it's under tension. And that's that's what the scoop is here. It's under tension. And and it makes the whole system really, really strong. John, Thanks, this, is, this is Crystal. To carry, yes. this, to carry this thought one step further, if I had the shims nuts, set correctly in other words the number of them when you push on the brake pedal between let's say uh two miles to 30 miles an hour would you hear a, a like a tonk tonk when you press on the brake no you shouldn't hear any noise when you when you press on the brake How, tell me about your calipers are they are they original or are they replacement calipers the originals that i re restored rebuilt with okay. with all new guts so in other words, uh, and I also did uh, the new wheel bearings and the new shims, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. When I push, when I push the brake pedal, right? When I'm under thirty miles an hour from the left front area, I can hear a, a tonk. And well, I'm not. Let's see. Possibilities include um, the the brake shoes moving, the pads moving, the caliper moving because you didn't get the bolts tight. Um, so the, the caliper is actually shifting, um, shifting on the stub axle. Um, I don't think it's the bottom of the stub axle loose against the A-arms. Uh, you, you should uh, see what you can do. If you got two people available, have somebody somebody put some, some uh, pressure on the brake pedal uh, more and more and more and move the, you know, you're moving the wheel and, and just listening and, and trying to feel it. You shouldn't hear any noise when you're braking like that. I, 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 I'm not sure what it is, but you don't want it there. In okay, case thank you. a harbinger of something which is like, oops, you know. John? Yes. John, it's uh, Rob Nichols here in Vancouver. Yes, I had the same problem on my GT when I was rebuilding it. And you know the bolt that goes through in the uh, on the box with the clutch pedal and the brake pedal, and there's a bolt that goes all the way through that yeah. the two fit on. Mine was so corroded that it was stiff and it wasn't it wasn't rotating, so that when you put the brake on, it would go a certain amount and then it would hit the groove in that bolt and make a real clunk sound as it went all the way further. So okay. actually, the re, you know the cure was just to replace that bolt and and grease that whole whole system up because it was just rusted solid. Oh my gosh! Okay, yeah, I, I have I have seen that. Crystal said that she could hear it from the left front, but um, yes, yep. But that we had somebody last week or the week before talk about a, I think maybe a clutch, and and we talked about taking that out because there's there's washers and distance tubes and and all kinds of stuff in there. And it, it you know, if it's all greased up and everything, it, it should work real nicely. So anyway, thanks very much, Rob. So, all right, next one up here is my, speed, my speedometer. This is David. 
My speedo runs 10 miles an hour fast. Suggestions. David, are you still on? I am. Okay. I am, John. So check your odometer first. Okay. Check the odometer first. If the odometer is correct, then the speedo has to be reset. It has to be recalibrated. That's okay. All. And so any one of these places that have been mentioned, I think there have been four of them so, so far, can take it and they, they, they can... Um, um, duplicates 60 miles an hour by having their, their machine turn at whatever speed yours is, is supposed to be and reset that, that speed hole. Perfect. Well, I'm in Southern California, so that shouldn't be a problem. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's, that's a West Valley instruments. Yep. Correct. Great. Okay. Thanks, John. Appreciate okay, you're, it. You're very well. Whereabouts? How, how uh, you? I, I'm in uh, Huntington beach. I actually saw you at the the GT uh, down oh, in San Diego. So okay, all right. I, I was down there for a day or so visiting. So okay, I was just in uh, I was just in um, Carlsbad at GOF West. Yes, that's where I saw you. Yeah, I saw you walking by. Okay. So all okay. right, thanks. thanks. Yep, Bob Tatterson. Here's a question: Mechanical coolant temp gauge sixty three B failed. Oh, you already. Uh, we already. Um, yep, yeah, you already, you already got me there. Yep, got that. Ray Schmidt. Uh, what cleaner final coating product to use on the vinyl top. Um, I have an off-white vinyl top on a 75B. First of all, back up. <laughs> I got a couple standard lines here. Oh my gosh, never, never put on anything but a black top, right? I mean, we got cars that 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 weep oil everywhere. I, I God knows how they weep oil inside a cockpit, but I don't know what to use on a white vinyl top. I don't. I don't know what kind of cleaner, except when you go to Napa. I tease that one of my salesmen for Napa. When you go to Napa, there's all kinds of cleaners there, and you ought to be able to find all kinds of cleaners online. You know, for white vinyl to to get rid of of marks and all kinds of stuff. And then in the end, when you can't do it, you cover it up with white shoe polish. Um, I mean that. I I just Ray. Yeah, I just I don't know what else to to tell you. Um, so tan tops, tan canvas tops, tan carpeting, green car. Oh my gosh. It's just stunning. It's beautiful. But if you think about a tan top, you get a fingerprint on it. If you put your finger on it, you get a handprint on it. And if you put your hand on it, it's like, oh boy, it's, we used to have a can of, uh, of, uh, resolve carpet cleaner at the shop. And anytime somebody come in with a tan top, oh my gosh, I mean, you couldn't, it couldn't get out of the shop without getting a mark on it. It just couldn't. So we, we'd shake that Resolve carpet cleaner on it and brush it and blow it off with the air blaster and hope that it was uh, okay. All right, so 365 LU. Who can, uh -huh. who can update a blue label overdrive thrust bearing to the stronger black label design? So um, are you on? Are you online? 365 LU. So the late model MGBs have got a separate thin washer that breaks. And I, I have those. I, I I can supply those. I, I have I have those. I ha I've made those. Those are I have those myself because I, I just I have a bunch of them left from when I made a great big bunch of them. So here's the thing from Marty Bradley about a Zoom video playlist. Um, and that must have to do with something we've talked about. Um, David Basili, what causes a tag to hang up after startup and then unfreezes and begins indicating? I, I, you know, I don't know, but but it's the cheapest way out of that is a tap with your finger, just a tap with your finger. I, I, I'm any any sixty eight through eighty MGB. I swear, ten percent of the of the tachometer stick. And you just tap it, and it's it's all done. And it must must be that it's just a resistance to move. That's all. You get up to four thousand RPM, and the in the force on that needle is enough to to pop it up. But I, it's just so easy to to tunk it with your finger that um, I, I never um, pay a, an awful lot of attention. What's with your hat color? It's different. Yeah, I I my uh, um, it's blue. It's blue. My normal supplier doesn't have any more brown ones right now. It's um, 
are, are maybe a random out of supply or they're not that popular. Nobody else buys them. I bought the last ones. I don't know. John Fabry, uh, just something that came up as I was watching an old tech session live the other day that I missed. Sometimes things are talked about as being in the chat. It's not available for later YouTube recording viewers. So it's helpful to make sure the advice or comments also get out um, out loud, even if it's written down for easy use in live sessions. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, I wish uh, that's uh, Marty's working on that, right, Marty? <laughs> yeah, and I I do keep a trend. I I keep the chat. I save the chat, so I have the link. So if you ever need something or say, you know, who who said that? I can't remember. I can usually figure that out if it's been in the chat, but I don't have, I mean, there's the recording for the audio. So, we, but, but we don't post up the chat. So, cause we don't know how to do it yet. Maybe but I have it if you ever need it. There, there we go, but I'll, I'll try to do better. Um, 19, let's see, this is RCP, RCP it. Uh, 1980 MGB. Since spring, my turn signals have stopped working twice. Cycling the hazard flasher switch several times has fixed this issue so far. I assume the problem's within the hazard switch. Yes, it is. Although when I cycled that switch several times today, this, the a turn signal started working, but the four-way hazard lights still don't work. No good deed goes unpunished. Um, can the hazard warning light switch be disassembled and cleaned, or is it best to replace it? Also, how does one remove the switch from the dashboard? Yes, um, you can, uh, let me tell you, that switch is, is half the size of an old postage stamp. Oh my gosh, and it's got all these little tiny, tiny little pieces in it. So you gotta be like really dedicated. It's, you gotta be on the kitchen counter, with a white with a white piece of paper out there, and you have to keep things up because you can get things upside down that you don't realize aren't supposed to be upside down. It's dicey, but you can do it. I've done it. Unless there's something broken in there. Often there is because it's small and it's plastic and it's old. Uh, you can buy a new one. Um, to get it out of there, I, I want to say there's a spring-loaded clip on the back that if you squeeze it, squeeze it top and bottom, I think it'll slip out. Also remember there's a, a black wire and a, a red with a white tracer on it that um, that is for the illumination bulb. But I, I, I think I think I'm I'm correct on that. But the, the earlier ones are more easily um, repaired. These are these are tough for these late model ones. Grand yes. John, this is uh, Richard Pittenger. I don't know why my name showed up that way. Uh, I'm in Troy, Ohio. Yeah. Um, is your advice to just maybe continue flipping this hazard switch? <laughs> well, because it, it happened early in the spring. If and I, if, you know, flipped you, it 20 times or something and it started working yeah. and it worked all season. And then <laughs> in the last couple times I've had it running in the last two weeks or so, the turn signal stopped working again. So that was just today that I flipped the switch again, a hazard switch, and the turn signals worked. I don't care a whole lot if the hazard lights work or not, honestly. Well, um, the um, um, if usually if you just press, just put, use your thumb and just press it off, That'll 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 satisfy the contacts. But if it gets to the point where it's it's bugging you all the time, you can either buy a new switch, or try to repair the old one, or pull the plug off the back. The plug's got six wires. Uh, there's four in a square, and then there's a, a distance, and then there's two opposed, and those are greens. And you you jump the green wires. You take a take a paper clip and 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 make a little uh, a little U shape out of the paper clip. Put that in there, put some tape on it. Now the hazards will never work because it's not plugged in, but the turn signals will always work. So whatever's easiest for you. Fix the switch, buy another switch, or just jump the jump the plug. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I've tried I, I have had some success repairing other like power window switches in American cars and that, you know, taking them sure. apart gently. And uh, so I'm not really opposed to trying to you, you make it apart and clean contacts and stuff. Can't hurt. Can't hurt. I mean, you, you know, you could, you know, if you break it and it doesn't work at all, you can always put some glue on it. So it looks like it's there. Push it back in the dash and then just jump the plug. Are the oh, replacements? I'm sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I'm just, are the replacements that are available for Moss and others are are they pretty good quality these days? They're not as they're not as good as the originals, and sometimes the lettering is different in in size in size or or brilliance. So um, I, it, that that has been the case in the past. I don't know. Hey, yeah, John. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I've I've replaced some of the switches on my dash with new ones, yeah. and on two occasions they broke in my hands while I was trying to install them. So don't be surprised if the new ones break. Yeah. Extremely <laughs> easy. I don't, I, don't be, I don't want I didn't want to be too horrible about the new switches, but oh my gosh, that's so maddening. It's just like come on. Yep. Okay. Right. All right. Thank Thanks, you. John. Yep. Um, so it's then uh, we got grand POW here. Um, uh, when I turn the ignition switch, the, the tack needle goes all the way to the extreme end, remains there for a while. It's erratic. Um, anyway, yeah, that's that's the that's the unit itself. It's not the voltage stabilizer because that doesn't run the tack. So that said, if you have a, a battery charger on the car. Then, then, the, then it's it's going to screw. You know, you're running the car, and the battery charger is vibrating at 1800 or 3600 RPM. It's going to screw stuff up. Or if you've got um, electronic ignition, sometimes that'll screw it up. But if everything else is not like that, it's it's probably just a tag. So, and the Gary also says he had the same problem with his RVI tech, and. Um, um, He he's put in a, a a link which I cannot read. <laughs> uh, Gary has here on on how you can get some guts, some replacement guts. Say Greg with a seventy eight midget, my sixty eight oh says seventy midget, but he's talking about a sixty eight B rear uh, is a part, and I measured the play between the axle gear and the housing, the thirty five thousandths. Is that going to cause a clunk? Um, your salon, Greg. I'm here, John. Okay, so this is this is between the the differential and pinion wheels. Yeah, the pinion wheel and the differential. I took a screwdriver and pushed the gear over, yeah. put a feeler gauge in there, and thirty five thousand slides right into through. Yeah, I it should be less than that. Um, uh, the you know the hemispherical washers are still. Copper, who told us two times ago, three times ago, who was making the copper washers? Those are better washers for the for the differential gears. The pinion gears are the are the ones with that we've got the hemisphere, hemispherical uh, brass, but the the um uh the flat ones for the differential wheels, um those are those are the ones that um uh somebody somebody told us that somebody had them available. Um, John, they're no longer available. That's Mason down in Lubbock, Texas. All right. Okay. All right. John, thank you. Okay. I just got some from Brown and Gammons. Brass ones. Brass ones. Hey, okay. Brown and Gammons. There we go. Okay. They, they're, they're, they're available only in 5,000 and 13,000 over. Okay. So you buy all four. Right, you buy you, you buy standards fives, and I so when you get thirty bucks wrapped up in it or something, I don't know. It's just a guess, and um, um, and then selectively fit them so that you've got several thousands instead of thirty five thousands. Thank you, Brown and Gammons. Name again? Uh, Brown B R O W N ampersand Gammons G A M M O N S, and they're in England. Baldock. They're in Baldock, Herefordshire, uh, in England. 
the uh, the website is ukmgparts.com. I put it in the chat. Thanks. They, they're not labeled. Thank you. Class, uh, but when you uh, when you buy them, they are. Okay. Thank you. You you got them there in your hand? Yeah, I do. Show, show them to us. Uh, let's see. Yeah, brown and gammas. Okay. Yeah, and see there. Oh Thanks. yeah, those, yeah, yeah. They're, instead of being plastic, very cool, very cool. There, there is now a source for those. Wonderful. In five and thirteen thousandths over sizes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ed Cook. Ed, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still here, John. Hey, okay. Removing previous owner's pancake air filters and replacing with standard MGB filters, HIF 74 GT. Do I need to change the mixture at all? Oh, maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're fiddling around with it, maybe. Um, you wouldn't. I wouldn't expect it to be any different because at idle, you, you only set the, the mixture at idle, and at idle, there's just not enough airflow to cause a problem. But but at high speed, what was happening, what may have been happening with those other filters, is that it was enriching because the, you can't get enough air through that little tiny little tiny bit of foam. Um, so so um, you may not have to change it. Now, I mean, you're going to test it anyway. Once you get those on, you're going to use those piston lifting pins and just, just check them and see. Easier to check it when the air cleaners are not on. But um, that's, you get um, the, the difference between pancake air filters and original air filters on an MGB is two horsepower. Go figure, two horsepower on how many horsepower? On 60, 60 at the rear wheels. That's, that's a real good output at the rear wheels. So putting the original air filters on with the with the radius with the radius um, will will pop you up two horsepower over the pancake ones just because of the airflow. It's just you it just it's what that much? Yes, that much. So uh, I think the I think the previous owner liked them because they were nice and shiny chrome. But, uh... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, I mean, look at them, you know, and then and then the, the other ones are like twice as thick with the MG embossed on a on a on a convex on a convex one of them. Yeah, like, that's that's the ones that, that's the ones that somebody put on there. They're okay. big shiny chrome things with MG on the outside. Yeah. So those are going to trash. Put them on eBay, Ed. Somebody will buy them. You know? <laughs> I, I don't sell I don't sell parts anymore, John. Yeah, I saw that. So okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so here we go to Lawrence Kaplan. On John's YouTube about changing the gasket on valve cover, the gasket is affixed to the cover and grease is applied to the engine. The question is, what type of grease? Uh, NLGI number two lithium grease. Just the same grease that you use everywhere. The same grease that you use on uh, wheel bearings, the same grease you use when you're assembling up the engine, the same same grease you use everywhere in the, on the seat slides. Um, Lucas, go figure, why would Lucas sell grease? Um, that's the kind of grease that I buy from Napa. Um, and why do I keep talking about Napa? Because I can go, I drive right down the street and they've got the stuff, they've got a catalog. And now if you go in there and ask them for a 5 8 freeze plug to fit in the bottom of your automatic choke on a Stromberg carburetor, um, it'll take them two days to find a listing for a 5 8 freeze plug. Used to be they had a page with all the different sizes of freeze plugs in order. They can't do that anymore. It's real sad. Um, but for just normal, real handy stuff, they've got a wonderful supply, a wonderful listing of stuff. So that's why I'm always talking about NABA. And, and the, the grease that they carry is manufactured by Lucas. Uh, it's real sticky, red grease, really, really sticky, sticky grease. All right, next one up here. Um, yep, yep, and uh, Robert Davidson. Hey, Robert, how you doing? 
Uh, my speed okay. runs fine until I get down to about 15, or, uh, 15 miles per hour, and the needle begins to bounce. Same with starting from a dead stop, up to 15. Above 20, it settles down. At very low speed, it bounces like a basketball, and it's done this for ages. So the faster you go, the more drag there is on the speedo. These are just some guesses here. But the the on the back of the speedo and the and the and at the gearbox, there's a square. It's not this big, it's just real tiny, right? And the speedo cable is supposed to be square and fit into it, but the speedo isn't square. It's just it's hammered it instead of instead of being well, I can't do it with my hands again. Instead of being squared off, it's it's put into a um um sort of a bulgy uh flat surface and it and it wedges it wedges in on one corner and the other corner it doesn't catch all four so that's all that's all what all new speedo cables are it, it, as I remember and it might be that it's wiggling around in there at those low speeds once you get up to a higher speed um then there's enough drag on it that it, it doesn't bounce um what else does that uh, the the oil pressure oil pressure gauge it's on some mgbs when you're idle the oil pressure gauge is constantly bouncing um and then as, as soon as you pick up the speed a little bit it goes to the higher figure and just rests there and stays there um because it, you got you, you got that fluttering at, at, at the bottom end so i don't know except for changing the speedo cable robert i don't know yeah that that seems to be good i know if uh, when you end up with problems with the speedo cable, or sometimes you know you'll see the it'll whip, and you see the yeah. But mine doesn't do that. Once you get above twenty miles an hour, it's pretty stable. It just at low speed, especially if you're like fifteen or ten, it just bounces up and down. And it's done it forever. But the unit is accurate, so yeah, I haven't done anything with it because it's like it. It, you know, it, you're opening a can of worms, I guess. Yeah. Well, the old, have you ever changed the speedo cable? Uh, yeah, I got rid of the angle drive years ago when you I, you were still on Eastern Avenue and my angle yeah. drive crapped out. Yeah. And you said, put an overdrive cable on it, ditch the angle drive. Was and that, that was still the same cable that's on there. What was it bouncing before that? You probably can't remember Boy, it's kind of hard. It, it might have been. The only other thing that it does is on like a little trip meter, the numbers never quite line up straight. They don't sit straight in the window. But yeah, we're going back 30 years. <laughs> right. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is that. And, that if, you know, I, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Well, like I said, it's accurate. So yeah. I guess if, it, like the old, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yep. Okay. Uh, John Tershak, visiting my in-laws in Reading, UK, had a late night in the pub. Oh, and then a sister, what you already told us about this. Um, and uh, uh, we're talking about, no, no, here, here we go. I, 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 I got to get through this. 1971, visiting my in-laws in Reading, UK, had a late night at the pub, and then my sister-in-law at their place, 1 a.m. Now we're staying at my wife's parents' home, uh, which is the bottom of a hill going back to her mom's home and reaching the top of the hill ready to head down. I forgot about driving on the left side. Shouldn't do that in England. Meet a big black car coming up on the correct side. Ran the car off the road, no harm done. Later found out it was the mayor of Reading, who no doubt had a driver, like like I said, no harm done. Wife still kids me about it. Yeah, my my mother said she went around a roundabout the wrong way when she was driving in England in 19, uh, 1947. So, yeah. Um, anyway, it's just... just it was like fun with the knock on the door the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh boy. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. They do have a sense of humor. That's a good thing. Let's uh, see. John, everybody, I have a 7576 midget. John, are you on with the midget? Yes, I am. 
Okay, all right. I uh, want to remove the EGR device and replace the speedo from the instrument to the gearbox. What cable can I use? So um, you can you got that counter? You've got the you've got the EGR counter. Yes. So you, can, you can use a speedo cable. Oh. You're going to have to call me tomorrow because I can't, okay. I can't make this work in my head. Um, they changed the speedos and the cables up at the dashboard end in 77 through 80. Did they do that with the midgets also? Otherwise, I'd say just get a 77 midget cable, but I can't. Did they change the speedo in 77 on a midget? Or do you, do you still have the small face? Oh, I can't, I, I can't make this work in my head. I don't know. Um, Unless there's something I can put in between the two pieces of cable to bridge no. where the EGR would be. You already got something there. You already got the EGR. Yeah, I just want to take that out and be done. I understand. With it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, um, I'll call you tomorrow. Um, yeah, and then... and then um, I got a couple of follow-ups there. Oh, yeah, okay. And then, and then the EGR... Where is that EGR device? Is that it's there's a short cable that comes through the firewall, then the EGR is mounted. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I've got that. I you do the EGR device. I'm thinking of the of the actual valving on the on the manifold. That's what I was oh. going okay. for. And I, I was having to close my eyes and try to remember that too, but I don't have to. So okay. All right. So it seems to run cold, barely halfway to normal. How can I test the water temp gauge? Um there's a a, a an infrared pyrometer. I bet you could, it's so handy, you can buy it, use it on the car and leave it in the kitchen and your wife can use it for cooking. Literally, it's a, like a little handheld device. It's got a, a, a laser beam that you point at whatever you want to get the temperature from and it'll tell you what the temperature is. It's just, it's phenomenal. I bet Harbor Freight has them for $58. Um, so that's the best way to tell what's going on. Now, if it's not accurate, accurate, what do I do? You still have the um, you still have a safety gauge, right? Um, yes. Okay. So you can take that fitting out of the out of the head. You can put it into a pan of water. You can boil it and see and see if it if it if either it reads two twelve, but you got a CNH gauge, or if it reads hot, you know, and, and you can see that when it's at normal, it ought to be around one hundred and ninety to one hundred ninety five or something. So that's that's a pretty you lose antifreeze out of the system, um, but that's a just an easy way with a pan. It's still a two person job, sort of, because there's no place up there you can put the pan of water and and run around and take a look at it and you know anyway. And if it's not accurate, do I have to have it rebuilt, or is there some way to adjust it? Yeah, no, there's no way to adjust it. You have to have it rebuilt. Okay. Hey John, I just looked on Amazon. Those pyrometers are anywhere from. $10 to $20, buy three <laughs> of them. They're the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's great. It's, you know, you can, I mean, oh, you that's know, great. You're, you're making candy there. Yeah, there it is. That's too close. Move, move it back a little bit, a little bit, a little there. bit, move it back, 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 there. It's in focus there. Yeah. Pyrometer, P-Y-R-O-M. Pyrometer. Thanks, Chubb. That's very kind. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and um, in your in your midget oil pressure gauge often sticks and then jumps five pounds. That's something in the gauge. That's not the engine. So so you can make a case here now, uh, especially if the if the temp gauge is wrong of taking the unit out and threading it. Take the battery out because when you're you've got this long capillary line that's a that's a, a metal line and when you're dragging it all the way through the dash which is just a bugger you know that thing's flopping all around underneath the bonnet and it'll touch the positive post of the battery and then it certainly won't work um so you know get rid of the <laughs> or cover the battery or something or other so it can't touch it in the fuse box or or the or, or use two people one person feeding it through and then it's just it, logistically, it's just a nightmare, but you can do it. Okay. Thank you. Yep.
Rob Nichols, what's your opinion on installing an inertia switch on the on the fuel pump wire? Nah, uh, it's you know that was introduced in 1977 through 1980, so that if you bump something, your fuel pump is disconnected, which means if you hit a pothole, a big enough pothole, it turns your fuel pump off. You know, it, it, it's it's um, I, I just I don't. It's a safety device. It was mandated by the federal government and the Canadian government also uh, follows that too, usually. So, so, uh, Pat, Pat from California. Uh, I need your mailing address so you can go on my website. It's on there, but it's also Pat, if you're on, are you on? It's in the chat too. Oh, it's in the chat too. All right. Okay. Yeah, there, 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 there we go. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Thanks for, for, for doing that. Yep. And um, Dr. Rosevear, do you have any suggestions on how to remove the fuel sending unit from the tank and installing uh, and sealing a replacement sending unit? So you run the tank down, Doc. Are you still on? I'm going to be driving right past your house. I'm here. Yep. Yep, I'm driving right past your house on, on my way to Crystal Lake next week. Um, um, so the fuel sending unit use a blunt chisel. This is this is off your B, right? Yeah. Yep. 72. So use a blunt chisel. You get that ring that goes in there to hold it. And it's got three tabs on the on yeah. the and use a real blunt chisel. Tunk, 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 and unscrew it and unscrews. 20 degrees, 30 de degrees at the most, and then just lifts out. Um, you want the fuel down to as low as you dare run it, and then jack up the car on the on the right-hand side so the gasoline that's remaining in the tank all rushes off to the left side, and um, and then you you can you can leave the tire on too. You just jack the car way up in the air on a, on an angle, and and uh, you can. You can get that ring out of there, pull the sending unit out. Underneath the sending unit is the ARA 1501 uh, sealing ring. So you get the new sealing ring and the new ring that goes around it. And my suggestion is fix your old sending unit, take it apart, look at it. There's a broken wire. That resistor wire, you can't solder. It won't, it won't solder. It won't take solder. But you can take a, a, a single strand of copper wire out of, out of just a 16 gauge wire, make a loop and fold the um, resistance, resistance wire around it. And then, and then you can solder to the uh, copper wire and that, that, that solder will envelop the resistor wire and, and uh, make a good connection. So I, I've always done that on those to, to fix them because the new ones aren't- Is the good. guts of the gauge? John, can you hear me? Yeah. No. So I, I see your hand. You hear me now. The yes. guts of the gauge rotate with the chisel? No. Oh. No, just the ring. Okay. Just the ceiling ring. Yeah, there's there's uh, there are two offset pin um just the ring rotates. Okay. So the ring the ring unscrews okay left hand direction. And then when you when you go okay. to Again, grease the tank, grease the ceiling ring, grease both sides of the sending unit, grease the new ring, put it all to, together. Use that same blunt, same blunt chisel, tunk, 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 round, round, round until until it until it can't, it's not turning anymore. It's on a cam and it forces the by turning the ring, it forces the sending unit back against the, the rubber, the rubber seal. No, use lots of grease when you reinstall it. How is the Red sending grease. unit? Just a second. Um, uh, just a second, Bradley. What's up, Doc? Grease, you know, you just order your red grease. Number two grease. Red grease. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bradley, you were you stepped yeah, in. Yeah, how is the sending unit uh inserted in an MGA tank? Uh, with six screws, and you can buy. Uh, I think they're five ba, four ba screws. I bet they're not three. Anyway, it's a British size. Um, 
and uh, you can buy what appears to be a rubber ceiling ring. I don't know what it is, neoprene or something. Apparently it's not Viton because now and then I hear people say that they buy the rubber ring and it leaks. So buy the cork ring, buy the cork, cork gasket like it was on there originally and use number two Permatex, used to be called number two aviation. It's um, color maple syrup, sticky beyond belief. Guess it get on your fingers, it'll be on there for three or four days, just the way it is. It, it probably comes off with lacquer thinner, but um, it's, uh, uh, it's real sticky and put that on the screws too and, and, and put it all, all back in. And you can fix, uh, you can fix uh, the sending unit on the MGA. And again, you, you'll end up with a better, a better job fixing yours than, than you will buying a new one. Uh, if you, Bradley, if you send me a note, I'll send you the pictures. I don't have an explanation, but I get about 20 pictures. I don't have 20. I bet there's a dozen pictures in succession that show how to lift the, the wire wound resistor tube out of the unit and, um, um, and then make sure there's a grounding wire in there and so forth. So, Thank you. Okay. So you got uh, right up on that, John? I do not. I only have pictures. So you have to imagine what's going on from the pictures. John, can I uh, offer a modern solution to leaky sending units? Sure. Um, Doug Pelton at From the Frame Up uh, has manufactured a far superior uh, seal for the sending units. And he also supplies a product called Seals All. And it's like we died and went to heaven. Okay. We can make sending units that don't leak anymore. So um, Doug Pelton sells TC parts, but, yes, the, but, but the, the ring, the ring for the TC, TD, TF, MGA, and midget gas tanks is all the same size. Correct. So, so this is from the frame up in Phoenix, Arizona. From the it's frame bomb. up. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. All right, Rudy, Rudy, the VIN on an MGA is, is the uh, car number or the engine number? Well, the VIN is, is the car number, HDK, I don't know, Rudy, are you still on? Mm, we may have lost, oh my gosh, it's 910. And I haven't even made a pitch, a, a second pitch for uh, going on the my website and, and the, um, making a donation, but this is my pitch. So um, the VIN on an MGA is, is, the, is the VIN. It's stamped in the frame, which is always rubbed off. On the right-hand side, just, just underneath your knees, there's a, a cross-member piece there, and you hardly ever can find it there. But it's on the, on the plate that goes in, in, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, firewall, not the firewall, but the horizontal plate that's up there in <laughs> earlier MGAs. <laughs> Pat, that smoke's come through my through my computer. Got me coughing. I think my brain saw it and then decide, decided to cough. Um, it, it's an HTK number or a GHM number. Um, but sometimes, depending on the state where the car was sold, sometimes they used engine numbers. Um, so um, what's on your title is, uh, it, it could be either number. Um, and that's a real problem if you swap engines. Could be, yep. Okay, Bradley Schwartz, please explain how to replace the motor mounts in an MGA. Uh, the, engine, the engine is too low to engage the hand crank. You look at those blocks on there and see and see if, if they're if they're bulging. It's pretty odd to have them sag so much that the engine's sitting too low. Chances are there's something wrong with the front bumper. 
Uh-huh. It, that chances are it's it's not the engine, but but getting getting to it. So um, I mean, all almost all MGAs have been hit in the front, almost all of them. You know, and they're real weak up there, and, and they've been repaired, and it looks great. But you got about there's three or four holes that you got to get in line to get to the engine. Um, yeah, there's a bumper hole, and then there's a hole and a, and a cross member behind that. So um, there is a plate. There is a, uh, I mean, this is a half measure. I mean, you, you're going to do it however you wanted to do it. I don't know how close the engine sits to the bonnet. I don't know if there's a, I just don't even have a clue. Does it sit an inch away from the bonnet? Does it hit, sit a sixteenth of an inch away, two inches? I don't know, but you don't want to get it so high that you interfere with the with the uh, with the uh, the bonnet and the engine. But there are plates that go on an MGB on the left hand side, underneath the underneath the the saddle mounts, uh, only on the left hand side to get the engine kicked correctly. God, why did they just put them out in the right place? Anyway, they didn't. So um, there's a plate there. You can buy those plates, which is the same plate as the bottom of the motor mount. And you could jack the engine up ever so slightly and slip a plate in both sides. And that would lift it up. That would lift it up, um, I don't think, a, a quarter of an inch, but I bet it would lift it up some. But I, I bet your problem lies in that in, in the alignment of the front bumper and so forth. You just have to figure out what, what's going on. The, the engine is about uh, half an inch too low, I'd say. Quarter to half inch too That's low. That's a lot. That's a lot. Then I just, I, if, if the engine mounts are all gooey and bulged out, but almost always they're nice and rectangular because they, they don't get covered with oil. Um, right, unlike right. unlike the, the, the gearbox mount, which is always washed in oil. And there's always bulgy and gooey, especially on MGBs. Um, okay, I'll take a look. Thank you. Okay, John, on the MGA, it's usually the front engine, uh, front uh, frame extension, isn't it? That's been damaged. That caused yeah. it to be off. So again, we're back to sports car craftsmen. Um, so you can take the front frame extension off. Oh boy, this is easy. Um, so the front bumper comes off. The front splash apron comes off. The front frame extension comes off. Well, if you're going to do all that, now you're going to get the front frame extension that's got the divots in the top, and you're going to mount a front anti-sway bar on your MGA. You put that all back to together, but if the body shop had been repairing some damage and it all fits now, and you get the right stuff, it ain't going to fit because <laughs> they made it fit, right? So, yeah, it's it's hard hard to know, but... Uh, John, on that front extension for the MGA, if it, the bumper is the only thing that is off, you can take that bumper off, and with those extensions on there at the house, you can take a pipe and bend it until you get a, what you think is close by, put it back, the bumper and everything together, see if it's right, and if it's not, take it back off, redo yeah, that's okay. So Bradley, that's what that's what uh, John's saying is take the front bumper off and then put your starting handle through and see if that lines up. And if that does, then then figure out how to move the front bumper. But the front bumper runs right right at the lip on the on the front of the body too. It, it's not. I can't. I I just looked at that. He, John suggested that I went out and looked at the car. The bumper is is level, but there's not a, enough space between the bumper and the and the tub of the car, the body of the car, to raise the bumper. Maybe I should just enlarge the hole in the bumper. <laughs> good, good, good. Because it's behind my it's behind my registration plate anyway. You can't see it. Oh, well, then, then there is a moot point. You can't get a crank in there anyway, right? Well, I if it's an emergency, I take the <laughs> I take the plate off. Oh, you get somebody to push it. There was just a movie that, well, not just a movie that came out, a movie that came out, um, maybe six years ago, called The Age of Adeline. It's got um, uh, Harrison Ford in it. <clears throat> it's about a, a woman who's, who stops aging in 1913 or something or other, and, and the trouble that she has in her life uh, it, when she finally meets the guy that, that, that uh, she wants to hook up with at the age of 107. But there's a, a picture of her in 1958 in England where she's met the young Harrison Ford, and she's out in the middle of a of a, a two track in England, and she's pulling the starter motor, and an MGA, 
right hand drive A. And this Harrison Ford guy says, Well, here, I'll just give you a push and pop the clutch. And of course, it starts right up. And I thought, Well, why didn't it start up with the starter motor? Come on, it's, it's not and whoever was writing it. They should have had like her battery's dead. She left her lights on because she's bird watching or something. Anyway. Um, okay, while we're on that, John, I've got a question for you. Yeah. This, we had a, a little car show over at the uh, Clemson International uh, ICAR, whatever it is, International Auto Research. And I got into a contest. I had the TD, and my buddy has a, a, a contemporary, I think it's a 53 or 4 uh, uh, TR3. And we were going to see who could uh, start their car first with the hand crank. And I had started the TD with the hand crank before, so I thought I'd be reasonably in the competition. The only thing I can think of, okay, so he he pulls his uh, hand crank, goddamn TD, I mean, the TR just starts right up and hums. I pull on mine, I turn it, I spin it. I got three college kids that are twice as strong as I am. They put, turn it, things turn it like crazy, will not start. Turn the... Uh, uh, pull the, uh, the starter knob, this is on the TD, pull the starter knob, starts right up. The only thing I can think of that I've done between the time that I had successfully started it with the crank and now is put in a super duper fancy CSI uh, electronic ignition, but I can't believe that's the problem. Any thoughts on why I lost that damn contest? I hate oh. it that you're shaking your head. No. Turn the key on. He was on. Yeah, we, we checked that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We checked that. Yeah. Turn the key on. Uh, I, I'm losing all my strength, but I mean, we had some some strong college kids. No, you got, you know, you usually, thing. usually one. It, maybe it has to do with the speed of the speed of the spin over in that in that new ignition. Because I mean, theoretically, you turn it you turn it ninety or 180 degrees, and it'll start. Uh, yeah. That's what it yeah. was in the past. I may yeah. borrow somebody's distributor so I, and see if they start. At our summer parties, we used to have um, uh, contest. We had, always had contests, you know, whose cars the nicest. I used to have a moving contest. Well, after a couple of accidents, I quit having moving contests. But one of the contests was how fast, you know, you're, you're in your car. Okay, you're sitting in your car. You got to jump out. You got to get the starting handle out. You got to start up the car. And of course, one guy, one guy ends up chasing his car, you know, because he he'd left it in reverse. Um, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, it's kind of funny, but I'm glad there wasn't a little kid behind him or something that would have rolled right right over it. Oh my gosh, yeah, you have to be so careful. Um, so anyway, there's some information there on how to line that how to line that all up. So. No lush. I was told that if you exhale completely, your hands will shrink just enough to reach under the dash. Well, okay. So this this has to do with changing stuff on, under the dash. If you exhale completely, if you hold your mouth in the right way, it, it helps too. Um, ben Andrews, who's got an MGC among other cars, with regards to the oil pressure feed pipe flex hoses, would you trust the new ch Chinesium? I uh, shouldn't that be capitalized? Chinesium over the old original. Uh, on a larger scale, I recall you telling a story about someone losing their oil from a new braided oil cooler line. Yeah, that happened um, maybe five, six years ago. There was a rash of, of bad oil cooler lines and, and flex lines. They're just made poorly and not crimped right. And, um, you know, you, you don't drive watching your oil pressure gauge. You only look at the oil pressure gauge when you get some ungodly noise from underneath the bonnet, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden your, your eyes sweep that would should sweep the dash and the oil pressure is reading zero. And at that point, it's usually too late. So, um, those oil, oil feed flex hoses, I think they're okay now, Ben, I think they're okay now. That's what I, I think. Um, Oh, and Crystal's found a way that she's uh, she's um, pulled pulled the center of the of her steering wheel out, and now, now the whole 
Horn Bush Center, they're okay. We got that sorted out. Great, great. So that's uh, that's a good deal. So I'm going to be down there, um, uh, not too far from Houston. I'm going to be in uh, Katy, Texas, next April at the MGB meet. So Crystal, if you're going to be down there, I'll I'll be able to meet you. Um, and here's a long discussion about where Crystal lives exactly. Um, okay, Bob G, how do I fix the dash light? Dimmer switch. Mine's too dim. Why didn't I have that in here? Oh my gosh. You don't fix well, you can replace it. You can replace it. You need a prick prick punch to push in on the on the hole in the in the knob, pull the knob off, get the nut off, pull it out from the backside, get a new rheostat, put that in, hook it up, but don't just jump all those wires. There's uh there's reds or red with green and uh, red with whites and just get some piggyback terminals and put them on the switch, make them all common. And then your bright, your dash lights are all um, bright all the time. Um, and John, then, so John, you just, you just match the wires, John, match the wire colors. Yeah. Just um, the other, there's what, what year is the car? 73. Yeah. So you got um, uh, red and no, maybe it's red with green. Anyway, in red with white, they're they're on the on the spade terminals on on the rheostat. So just just get a piggyback terminal and put it on uh, the other side. Uh, it, it just make all the wires common on one side of the switch. Maybe wrap a piece of tape around it so so nothing's too exposed back there. But just make all those wires common. That are on the switch now, and you'll get full, full battery voltage to the switch to the lights. John, we used a made a little jumper cable to keep the dash lights on. I mean, why would you ever want to dim them? You can hardly see them now, so we just bypassed it. Yeah, John, yeah, that's John? The, that's the easier way. Yep. Yeah. John, this is Dan from Slidell again. Yeah, I replaced my rheostat with the so-called replacement the rheostat they sell nowadays, and the spade lugs stick straight out. Everything worked fine. I have demo LEDs in it, by the way, but uh, everything worked fine until I bolted the dash in place, and then the, the spade lug shorted to the uh, the the, <laughs> the vat thing up there and smelted the wires oh. you know, to the, the frost event. So oh. I now have a fuse in that in place of the re my brand new rheostat, you know. So yeah, okay, all right. But the LEDs do make a big difference. I recommend them a lot. Yeah, the, yes, absolutely. Those LED dash lights are just dynamite. I replaced all the bulbs in my daughter's MGB GT. I went to Napa. I think they're nine eighty sevens. I think I keep calling them that. Maybe that's the old Lucas number. I don't know. Um, put all new bulbs in there, and I was driving it at night. And I couldn't, I couldn't see, I couldn't see the gauges. I couldn't see the inside of the gauges because the new incandescent bulbs made with Chinesium, haven't heard of that before, um, were all, just all, all too dim. They're just all too dim. Now there's different wattages, but I, I, uh, I just took the ones off the shelf that they had. So anyway, I guess if you're putting incandescent bulbs, replacement incandescent bulbs in, that you should test them first. You know, not, so how do you tell the candle power? Maybe maybe Judd can go online and, and maybe uh, Harbor Freight has a has a gauge to, to check candle power. Okay. And John, can the, the LEDs just snap in without anything uh, special? I just put them in? So. I don't think so. I think there's more to it than that with the LEDs. But um, Mine were, well, I had a new wiring harness, but they just snapped them on. I had no problem at all. Okay, all right, but, okay. And I have halogen H4 headlights that I just bought cheap LED headlights. So with the got lights on, I draw five amps total with everything on. Yeah. Oh my gosh, five amps with everything on. That's like nothing. Yeah. That's yeah. that's 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 two more amps than the, the I think than the than the coil takes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Amazing. But, so John, just to bypass the rheostat, I just literally just reconnect the wires according to their colors. Just, just I recommend a fuse. Because the dash lights are not fused. The dash lights are not fused. I, I, I. It's extremely rare to have a problem in there. Yeah. But that's why I said wrap the wrap the connection with um, um, with some tape. 
Hey, John. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, the, when, what I did is the rheostat has two prongs on each side. So just move the red with green or whatever next to the other one, and you you have a built-in splice. Right. So you, you move all the wires to the same side of the switch. But sometimes, sometimes there's more wires than spades. So that's why I kept talking about using a piggyback, um, which which has got um, two two male spades uh, and a female. So you plug the female on the existing male, and now instead of having one connection, you got two. So yeah, you, you, you make them all common. Yeah. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, here we go. Pat G uses foreign speed all in San Diego. So there, there's even there's even more to repair the safety gauges. So there's even more places than that. British Speedo Service, Westchester, Westchester, New York. Marty's got a whole lot of stuff here on the side that I can't read um, for, um, um... oh, here we go. And here's that front, front um, uh, set, setting up the wheel bearings. Uh, it's my video number eighteen zero one eight is setting up the front the front hub bearings. Yep. John. Yes. Hey, Alan. Uh, Alan, yeah. Um, uh, can I ask a quick question about we were talking about pancake air filters a while ago? Um, and on my MGC. Uh, it's got uh, pancakes with the uh, K and N's in them. But um, if I went back to the original air filter setup, uh, would uh, that make a difference on the MGC? Yes. Okay. Yes. The the, the problems. Other... The problems. Oh, and I heard that that uh, Kirk Robert Kirk passed away. Yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, maybe that was in the last. Uh, I heard someplace maybe it was in the last. Um, Zoom session, but uh, getting those getting those filters, I don't know what I, I'm, I'm not I'm not that skilled in the MGC stuff, but some there's got to be some place you can get a filter that's close enough to those original yeah. filters. Okay. The other question with that, um, the shorty uh, the sh uh, start uh, short stub, stacks stub stub stacks. So, yeah, stub stacks. Okay. <laughs> Are they supposed to, on the the H6 uh, carbs, are they supposed to be uh, uh, stub stacks on those? The original the original air cleaners have got that radius built into the aluminum backing. So ah. that, that is the stub stack. It's, okay. it's a stubby stub stack. Okay. Um, so. Uh, and again, that would improve the running, right? Well, you're going to add a couple horsepower to a to a car that you don't use all the horsepower on anyway. So, so but um, but if you're testing it, it, it it's 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 got to make it makes two horsepower difference on an MGB. It might okay. make three on a on a C. Okay. So, yeah, I mean it's 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 yeah. it's measurable. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. So Tim M um, says that uh, his speed is constantly bouncing. And that, that mostly means it's the cable, usually the cable. You always do the cheapest, simplest, easiest stuff first, and and changing the cable is, is easy. The, the cable that's turning on the inside of the sheath, uh, it, it catches, binds up, whips, binds up, whips, and that's why this, the, the, uh, the needle is whipping all, all the time. Almost always that, that that's it. So... And Rhonda says to Crystal, um, is it possible that you've got the front cross member pads warm, worn or bolts loosened? But I don't think so, because I think Crystal's car is going to all apart and all back together. So, but something, something's gone wrong up there. So let's see, Grand POW, when I turn ignition on, the tack needle goes to extreme end, remains there for a while. Uh, is erratic and then settles to a thousand. I've already answered this. Uh, it's not the voltage stabilizer. It's the um, it's the tack unit itself. Gary, I had the same problem with the RVI tack. Common problem is the electronic components age. I replaced a couple of the components and now it works fine. Some people switch to the RVC tack 
because it doesn't have the same problem. SPIDA, S-P-Y-D-A, also makes a conversion circuit board to update the RVI tech. So that's that's an interesting, interesting thing on there. Um, what is the number of the LED dash bulbs? I, I haven't a clue. I don't know, but I know um, it was one of the first things that uh, Jeff Zorn started selling from Little British Car Company 15, 20 years ago when he when he started up. One of the first things he sold was LED dash bulbs. My suggestion is buy from one of the one of the MG vendors, and they will know um, better. You had a line from Jeff Zorn, and they were just plug and play. Go with it. That's Little British Car Company. Yeah. But you have to know what yours are because my new dash wiring harness had a different bulb in it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, interesting. I, an 80, I have an 80 MGB, so that's they work, but they're so dull. And now that it's getting uh, dark so early around here, I I'd kind of like to know if I'm how much I'm exceeding the speed limit by. So. <laughs> I was you just kind of hoping somebody might have an idea as to what the LED. I've looked around, but I haven't been able to find anything yet. You can take your lighter, you know, you take your lighter and hold hold it close to the to the speedo. Uh, I'd have to start smoking again in order to carry a lighter, so mom won't let me do that. So many years ago, um, um, my late wife and I—I I don't even—I don't know if we we're married. Um, she and I, and Greg Purvis. Uh, drove uh, an MGA twin cam coupe down to Detroit to the to the GOF, the furthest west GOF they ever had, um, and um, and sold that sold that twin cam coupe to Jerry Gogan for fifteen hundred dollars cash and a TF. Um, and uh, so we we're going to drive the TF back. And Rick, Rick, um, oh, what's Rick's last name? Ricky. Um, Anyway, uh, Jerry thought we were going to haul it back. We were going to drive it. So first of all, we had to change the blown out freeze plug on the back of the T-type engine, uh, which at 2 o'clock in the morning, we finally got that all done. And as we're driving it back up, this is August. This is real early August, um, 1977. And uh, uh, Purvis was, had this Volvo. And Carolyn and I were traveling together, so we switched back and forth between the TF because it was just fright, frighteningly cold. Oh my gosh! I mean, we were not we were not dressed for um, for traveling at night in this thing, and we kept getting the lighter out and, and holding it close to the oil pressure gauge. Didn't care about anything else. It was just the oil pressure, just to make sure that the oil pressure was was up. Well, I I am done with my chat section here, so. Doug Clark, are you still on? Did you are, are you are you on tonight? Yes, John. Hi. Okay. All right. Time time for yeah. all right. Well, first of all, there are two hundred and three. Uh, oh, I counted two hundred and three. Oh my gosh! All right. Hey. All right. I counted two hundred, so I don't know about that. No. No. You're always a little more generous. Don't than don't, don't low, John doesn't like you to lowball. <laughs> I know, I know. So, but I actually I write down everybody's names too. I keep attendance. <laughs> uh -oh. So anyway, so here this uh -huh. is my this is my hat for t tonight. So from oh. Afghanistan, <laughs> this is the, my my Afghanistan. I, I had my two uh, my two grandsons, <clears throat> the Veterans Day um, celebration on. Saturday, and so I had them wear their late dad's hat with the with the name on the back. You know, this is the hat he wore in Afghanistan. So, Good. yeah. All right. I noticed um, you had a, a blue hat on tonight. I do. Um, yeah, and uh, um, that's different. I, I, uh, I hope the reason for you having that hat is not John is not because of me. Uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, <laughs> so I might have bought the last one or something. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, anyway, John, uh, so here we are separated at birth, at least by headgear. 
by headgear. Okay. Well, I still have some more hats to the golf. So I'll, I'll uh, you, you, you beat me hands down last time with that deer stalker, though. I had a deer <laughs> stalker at one time. I don't know what, whatever happened to it. So, yeah. So, but I, I still, I still have a nice head of, head of hair. Um, you do. So, yeah. So next week, next week, um, next week, Wednesday, I hit the three quarter mark. Or, or if on a fuel gauge, the one quarter mark on the on the way on the way down. But when you turn seventy five and you're at one quarter on your fuel gauge, you just don't know, you know, where um, <laughs> on your fuel gauge, you know, here you are at a quarter and here's empty, right? And like on an MG, empty's anywhere from about here to here. You know, you just don't know where. In this line, empty really is. I expect I'll find out in the next in the next 10, 15 years or so where empty really is. But anyway. All right. Well, anyway, thanks everybody for being on tonight. It's a real popular, real popular talking about the instruments. My gosh, I thought it was only carburetors that, that drew lots of people in. So anyway, this is nice. Well, happy Veterans Day, John, and thank you for your service and uh, welcome home. Hey, hey, well, you too, probably. Most most of us here are that age. Where most of us were, I was RA, RA all the way. Um, the Army had a two year enlistment program, and in 1968, when I quit college and I went down to the draft board, I said, "Well, how soon till I get drafted?" And it was Mrs. Atley. She lived up the street from us, who was the secretary there, and she said, "Oh, about a year." I said, "Oh my God." I said, what if I volunteer for the draft? And she goes, six months. And I said, I'm dealing in tomorrow. And she said, well, Army's got a two-year enlistment program. So I'll, I went over there, signed up, signed up real fast. I just want to get it in, just wanted to get in and in and out, wanted to get done. As it turns out, I served for 20, uh, 22 months. Um, because I came home from Vietnam and and uh, it was I was too short to to get reassigned someplace. Um Anyway, uh, yeah, RA. Yeah, when we're all lined up at, at uh, uh, Fort Wayne in Detroit to be inducted, uh, they had the they had the guys who joined step out of the line, and then all the all the guys who were U.S. who were who were draftees. The the guy that's in charge there goes one, two, three, Marine pulls the guy out. One, two, three, three. These guys are weeping, you know. <laughs> I don't want to be a Marine. It's like, well, hey, you know, you could have joined the Army or something. Anyway, yeah. You know, right. Back in the day. Yeah, that happened to a friend of mine. He was, I think he's bitter to this day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got drafted in 66 and I fought the war in New Jersey. Hey. That's, a, that's a dangerous okay. place. New Wait, Jersey. Fort Dix? No, I was at oh. Highlands Army Air Defense site up by Sandy Hook. Oh, okay. Highest point on the Jersey Shore. We were the command post for the uh, Nike Hercules. And while hey. we were there, nobody flew planes in the buildings. Then they just. Oh, yeah, my, my, uh, my, my late wife's cousin was a ski instructor. So, I, you know, in the Army. I mean, I, it's just. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Probably it's, AFRC. What's yeah. that? Probably AFRC, Armed Forces Rec Center. Sure, <laughs> something. Well, I, you know, I was talking to an old soldier from World War II, and uh, he said, "What well, we got these kits? They were supplied to to you know to the divisions, and they're all spread out. And they had all kinds of baseball mitts and footballs and and uh, um, um, fishing poles." And he said, he said, well, they're, they're, in, they're around the Hurricken Forest, around there. And he said that the Germans had, had run all these lines from trees to trees to trees and hooked them up to grenades. So you'd walk through there, and catch one of the lines on your on your feet and uh, and pow, the, the grenade would go off. He said, so they they'd stand down the line of trees and take this casting <laughs> this fishing pole and cast as far as they could and drag the line on the ground and catch those wires and, and pop the pop the grenades. Ah, uh, yeah, lots of stories. How are you, how are you doing, Richard? Did anybody else go to Tilly? Going quite well, thank you, John. Great, great. Hurricane. Richard's from Hurricane, West Virginia. Been there. Yeah. 28 years active duty. Well. 
What rank did you reach? Did you uh, reach? E eight. I was the first sergeant for actually uh, the medical recruiting command there in Detroit. My last assignment. Powerful guys, first sergeants, almost as powerful as sergeant majors. Almost. Yeah. I just the politics of the army was changing, and I it didn't fit me anymore. We we had a sergeant major that he he gets a phone call. A, a clerk says, uh, "Sergeant major, you got a call from General so and so," and he picks up the phone and says, "Hi, Bill, how you doing?" <laughs> well, oh, don't mess with the sergeant majors. <laughs> they're of equal rank, right? They're just they just command different stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, thank you all very much. Thanks everyone who's online for their service, whenever that was. Gloria, you too. <laughs> she serves an MG. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we were talking about reaching that oil. We changed our oil pressure thing. Gloria took out the tack and the speedometer and was reaching. Well, that's but, see, but look at the size <laughs> of her hands. <laughs> really, I mean, that is such. That is such. I. I mean, I did. I did massive hands. Yeah. And and I, I was but I, I did I had to take the I had to take the string column out and then line up underneath there you know with your with your feet up over the over the oh my gosh what a task using the steering wheel but you have to remember to undo the horn <laughs> right okay well I, I I took the steering column out I didn't just drop it I just I pulled oh. it all the way out <laughs> I mean with my rotund body there's no way that I, I was going to fit fit down to, underneath there and get all all that stuff. Fixed in. So, uh, uh, what before I forget, I want to ask you: You're going to order those um, parts for oh, the old. Thank you. Yeah, I I thought I'd have to remind you. <laughs> We're not as young as we used to be. Yeah, I like going to the gym so much. That last week, Wednesday, I went twice. Well, not <laughs> not really twice. I I almost got there the first time and realized that. I'd be exercising in my underpants if I if I didn't go back home and get get my stuff. So I I, I and then and then I had an appointment, a doctor's appointment right after that, and so I showed up uh, an hour early. Now, to be fair, the time had changed, and I hadn't changed all the clocks in the house. But I'm sitting there, and I, I finally went up to the desk, and I said, "What? Uh, what's a?" She said, "Well, you know, it's only quarter to nine or something." I said, "Oh yeah, sure." So I yeah, I went to the gym twice and went to the doctor's office twice. Yeah, yeah. Next Zoom meeting on the twenty seventh now. Well, yeah, I must be. Um, thank you very much. Is that yeah, twenty seventh? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I saw something about that. Yeah. So um, I and I don't know why we didn't have it on the sixth, but I, I had these. All, I've got them all set out. They're trying to make them all two weeks apart, but of course there's a couple more Mondays in the year than than uh, do it. I don't do it. Um, I tell people I, I have these bi-weekly, but they're really semi-monthly. So anyway, anyway, is so it, next one's the 27th. Yes, sir. Is the second one on Monday, uh, and fourth Monday? No, the second week not not always. It just depends. Um, hang on just a second. I'll tell you about December. Oh. Yeah, it looks like Christmas is a Monday, so that will be problematic. Yeah, we're going to have it on, gonna have it on Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got to uh, get a red suit first. The 4th the fourth and the 18th of December. So, yeah. so you'll do two weeks in a row from the 27th to the 4th? Well, I, I guess so. The way I got it lined up, I don't know why. Not in, hey, <laughs> hey. Well, and it would be Christmas and New Year's. We, you know, back to back. So right. you're going to miss two Mondays. Yeah. So, so it, it's so okay. uh, depending on the the weather and when the parts come in, we'll be there on the sixth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, thanks everybody for being thanks, here. Thanks, John. This is John. Please, great, great call. Talk to you later. Bye. Please yep. go thank you, night, John. Yeah. Thanks. Website and uh, make a donation. Oz. Those are always greatly, greatly appreciated. So happy right. Thanksgiving. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, Fred, thanks very much. Good night, John. Thanks again. Thank you, John. Good night. Thank you, John. Good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Good night.
Good seeing everybody. Hey, it is indeed. indeed. Thanks a lot, John. Oh, Barney, I didn't even hear from you tonight. I, you're out, you got a real crappy connection there. It's uh, it looks uh, looks like one of those science fiction films where the guy's trying to call in from Mars or something. <laughs> yeah, my camera didn't wake up tonight. Oh. I tripped in a couple minutes after nine. I was pretty late, but it was worth it. Glad okay. to see y'all here. Yeah, well, we talked about MGA fuel gauges just a little bit, you know. So, and uh, Ed Cook, nice to see you. I don't know if you're still on or not, but nice to see you on. And uh, Ron Nugent, nice. I was just, I was just out there, but I just, I, I wasn't out there long enough to say hi to anybody except my daughter and go down to uh, um, mm, Carlsbad to the GOF West. There's but, always next time. The, yep, the guys are um, trying to organize GOF West for next year in October and called me and said, would you be interested in coming out? And I said, sure. So I don't know if, if it'll all work out or not, but maybe I'll be out there. I said, how far? California is so huge, you know, you forget. And um, I said, well, you know, I don't know where they're talking about having it. And I said, well, how far is that from Los Angeles? And he goes, oh, driving? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I don't know, you know, six, eight hours depends. <laughs> oh my God, I guess if I come to it, I'll fly, you know. So anyway, from LA, anyway, rather than driving my daughter's car up there. Oh my gosh. So we have Charles Tisdall from New Zealand. What time is it there, Charles? It's uh, it's a, uh, 10 to 4 in the afternoon <laughs> on Tuesday afternoon. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm at work and uh, hiding. You're at work. <laughs> <laughs> You're at work. <laughs> I'm in the top office. Yeah, hiding. It's raining. Yeah, I can see the office. <laughs> you can see the office. Yeah, not a lot going on. <laughs> so, so my office is a little more colorful. Um, J Jacinda continues to be in the news here. So. Yes, you can have her. Keep her there. <laughs> Best place for her. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Funny. I'll say no more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I know, I know. We're waiting for our new government. They're having negotiations. Been oh my gosh! Well, yeah, we got it. You know, we got this two-party system, and it's just every now and then we get a third party that tries to cut in, and all it does is disrupt stuff. It's it's not a. We don't have any coalition governments that can no. exist. So where are where are you in Auckland or where? I'm in Auckland, John. Yep, yep. So we, we already talked about my my favorite MG film. Um, MG's Forever by Amy Bauer. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, cool. That's just my favorite. That's uh, my favorite MG film of all times. That was her, I maybe her senior thesis or something rather when she graduated. And she's she's gone off to Australia and she works for a television station there. But uh, you know, she mixed these eight millimeter films from the sixties oh. with with um, with video from from uh, you know from I my God, it's got to be. She must have done this 20 years ago now. And it's just a hoot. I mean, it's the same people. You know, she 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 morphs somebody who's you know tall and handsome and and thin and healthy into into what they were 20 years ago, which wasn't tall Amazing. and healthy. Yep. I, I remember I was cleaning my MG a few years ago now, John, but this guy walked past English accent and said, nice MG. And I saw, oh, yeah, we got talking, came in for a beer. It was Andrew Hedges, who used to race with Patty Hopkins. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Lovely guy. What's the chances in the middle of Auckland? He was out visiting a friend. <laughs> Very nice. So, yeah, it was lovely. Yeah, nice guy. All right. Well, it's uh, nine fifty-one p.m. on oh. uh, on um, Monday night here. Well, Monday night. Okay, I keep trying to work that. Out. Yeah. How do you? You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now we've got daylight saving, so we've we've moved an hour. So we're hoping oh, that's for because because you're in summer, of course. Yeah, yeah going into <laughs> summer, we we just we just left that that time, and uh, yeah, it was um, it's pretty nice here today, about fifty five, brilliant, oh, sunny. God. You know, I have to get my calculator out to tell you. Yeah, it's just the same. We got twenty three Celsius here. So. Okay, and it's a bit humid. That's all right. Mm. All right. Well, anyway, thanks for being here. Well, thank you. Well, uh, right. I thoroughly enjoy it. All right. Well, everyone, Bye. everyone, thank you very much. I'm going to sign off here. So, so thank you. It's a, always a pleasure. And thank we'll look you. forward to seeing everybody next time. 
Thank you, John. Good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Good night, John.